to the Appalachian Podcast. I'm your host, Billy Riddle. With me is my culturally appropriating disheveled co-host today. <laughs> Thank you very Simon much. Simon Witt. Uh, your words, your words. I, I am very disheveled today. I've been farmering. Um, I don't have anything terribly culturally inappropriate at the moment. Um, I'll think of something as the show continues on its merry way. Well, if you drink a few more drinks, maybe you can get up and do a rain dance for us or something. Yeah, why not? I mean, if, if the shoe fits, right? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> if the hat fits, wear it. it. Yeah, it's been a, been a heck of a week for us, of course, because, um, you know, my, my daughter's been sick, and it's it's the first time, you know, she's been sick to where it, it bothered me. You know, like, most of the time, I'm like, I hey, rub some dirt on it. She'll be all right. A couple of days, she'll be good. But it's been going on like four or five days now. And uh, the worst part about it is, is just a inefficiency of um, – the medical industry here in our local area. It's like, okay, my daughter's sick. I can't plan this. I didn't plan it. It's not like a routine pap smear, right? I know it's, where you're going with this, th- th- Billy. You cannot, you cannot time this stuff. So you call into the pediatrician's office here for the for the local people. Oh, we have to make an appointment. I'm like, okay, see her today. Well, we're filled up today. Well, how about tomorrow? Well, if you want to make an appointment for tomorrow, you got to wake up and call at 8 o'clock in the morning and hope you're one of the first 30 to get through and then you might be able to get your kids. No. Well, you just got to take them down to urgent care then. Okay? Go down to urgent care. Oh, I'm sorry. You need an appointment for it. Now, the urgent care is supposed to be an alternative to the to the freaking emergency room. You don't need an appointment for the emergency room. That kind of defeats when the did they, When did they bring the appointment in for uh, urgent care? Because that's horseshit. I would probably assume sometimes here in the last couple of years through the whole pandemic, um, when they probably lost a, a big portion of their staff by trying to force them to get an experimental needle to keep their jobs and a lot of them left and they probably, and, and then on top of that, you probably had a lot of people at that point in time that were old enough to retire. that were like, screw it. I'm going to retire now. I'm not going to keep dealing with this. So now you have a couple of big voids and, and, and staffing is down. Yeah. But they've brought in some of these uh, extra, sorry, these urgent care um, venues have been exploding all over the place. So what's They're going on? They're starting to close back down too. I know the one in Salem med express here recently, I guess. What's the, what's the one up here in Rocky Mount? I have no earth. That's not even a. That's not even a. No, it's not even urgent care. That's just some some like doctor's office. Essentially. There's, now there's an urgent care in Ferrum, right? No, the only urgent care in Rocky in Franklin County that you can get urgent care, as far as that's concerned, as far as I know, is either the emergency room at the hospital or down at Westlake at their. Urgent I could care have facility. sworn there's one in either Ferrum. I thought that's a new building. Uh, I don't out think on so. the. And if it is, it's not related to the same service that we are typically accustomed to. Oh, but I don't fantastic. think it is. I really don't think it is. But So an appointment for urgent care. Good job. Yeah, an appointment for emergency. It, it, it really boggles the mind. And um, and with kids. With kids. I mean, I mean you just the open the damn door, thing? right? Yeah, exactly. Where the PDs were, or all, you know, it's just, I, I, hey, look. The, it, why, it, why are you scheduling your, your, your appointments so you fill up a day? What you need to do is hold at least twenty percent of your scheduled appointments as open for walk-ins. So for walk-ins that people genuinely have, again, they couldn't manage a piss up in a brewery, so it doesn't surprise <laughs> me. <laughs> no, it really hasn't, and in, in, in the past few years, really has. If 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 you weren't already awakened to just the the dire state of our medical industry and facilities and whatnot in this country the last two years should have should have really just opened your eyes up about just how how ridiculous it is and and, and on so many levels and i'm not even just talking about the the overlying obvious reasons i'm talking about things like you know remember in new york city when the whole everything was going down and they took two they would say we're overcrowded everywhere we got this and this going on and and we got these pop-up tents because we can't hold all the people and all this kind of as a bloody great big ship came two, in as well right or was two, it two ships of them? and never i don't think either one of them saw a patient brilliant neither one of them saw a patient why because someone the, was running a scam because well, well that and because uh, the the person who ordered the ships to go into port to service those people was not of the same political affiliation as the governor of New York or the so, mayor or the mayor. So it got, I mean, that just tells you all you need to know about the medical industry that has nothing to do with saving people or making people better. You're testing my vocabulary like right now, Billy, because it's, I, I don't want to say some fairly bad words right now. 
I want to say some fairly after after having to deal with this stuff. With see the my, says, my see the restraint one. there. Do you yeah, see I, the restraint? Drink a couple more, and we'll see where the restraint says. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's shocking. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty irritated at it, and and I want to on one hand I want to encourage everybody to go out there and get in the industry, but there's so there's so many in the industry right now. It's like. That's all. I mean, that's all we have out there is medical school after medical school and nursing school after nursing school. Where are all these people going to work at, or are they working? What is going on? How come? Why is it so hard to find decent medical cut care in 2023 when we've got all this technology? I mean, it's just it's mind boggling how inefficient it is. It really and well that, that that dual billing doesn't help. Let me tell you. And, oh, sorry, did I just drop that one? And that <laughs> that is not that. This is not a knock on anybody that's working as a nurse or somebody that's going in and do do the hard stuff. Because look, I know every industry has got its people in it that are just trying to do the right thing. This is not you know just, just like the teachers. When I knock on the education system, I'm not knocking the teachers. I'm knocking the bad ones. So if you take offense to it, you must be one of the shitty ones, and I don't really care what you think. <laughs> But if you understand what I'm talking about, then then, then good. You you understand that, that there are serious problems that need to be addressed really, really quickly. Yeah, look look inward uh, is where I'm going with that because there's, there's some experiences I've had that um, left a very, very sour taste in my mouth. As to a prostate how. exam left sour taste in your mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Billy. That was just poetry. Um, but yeah, there's there, there's there's some shenanigans going on there um, with with how it's been politicised, how fear mongering has worked, how brainwashing uh, certain elements of the medical industry has allowed them to be dictators and nothing short of Nazis. Um, and when you start, you know, throwing fear and if you don't get this jab, you're going to die, um, quite frankly, is an absolute disgrace. And I am showing extreme amount of restraint now with my language because we need to call these people out. Um, I'm done with playing their little game and it's not going to happen on my turf or on my watch anymore. Yeah, this week really burned burn my, burn my ass pretty good, but we're going to... Trying to avoid, we'll, we'll save this one for a different show. We need to have some medical people on here, some some ones that that, that can at least come on here and be objective. Um, and 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 you know may, maybe maybe quell some of the issues that we might have, but that's for another time. Because we, indeed it is, it is. We'll, we'll, we'll save that because that's we want to go down a different road for this show. This show is supposed to be happy. I just want to say I'm just irritated about how things is, but my daughter's gotten a lot better, and unfortunately. Uh, uh, we didn't have to go to, to great extremes or links. Only just two visits um, for them to not come up with anything, but it's starting to take care of itself. Um, I was listening back to the last show, uh, our State of Appalachia. If you hadn't listened to that one, uh, it was Well, amazing. it's coming out tomorrow, right? Uh, well, for everybody listening to this show, it came out a couple of weeks ago. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but in our world, yes, it's coming out tomorrow. Uh, and – being the hundredth show, there was quite a few people we wanted to thank and remember, and there's a few that I that I forgot about, and it's not because of anything other than a high high level of inebriation going on in that room that night, and so I forgot a couple of people. But you know, I wanted to one thanks James Nagy. He runs a page on Facebook. You might be from Franklin County if you remember, which has phenomenal history. A lot of good ideas I've had for the show have come from that page. But he's also been a guest on the show, and he has a couple of those books, the um, uh, Franklin County and Smith Mountain Dam. Uh, here, off the top of my head, I can't remember the name of them, but they're kind of picturesque books, kind of go through and tell the history of the town. So, you know, he, he's been phenomenal for this show. He's given me a lot of ideas. He always kind of hits me up and corrects me sometimes on historical that I may have may not have screwed up. Or butchered. Butchered, yes. That's, that's more like it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Erica down at uh, Appalachian Mountain Supply Company in Boone's Mill, she's been really good with us and worked with us quite a bit. And her and Amy and Tim and all them uh, really appreciate, you know, all that they've done for us. And one big one that I forgot, and not to say that, that anybody else I hadn't mentioned is big, but as far as uh, Simon and my relationship with him, we forgot about Tyler. Over there at Five Points Music oh, for Sanctuary, goodness sake. we sure did. So, um, and I spoke with Tyler a few weeks ago, and I said I wanted to start um, before every show, uh, start kind of giving an update of what you got going on over there, and uh, I'm going to do that real quick. So, 
for this show when it comes out, probably you're going to be looking at sometime around mid March. So Friday, March 17th, you got Larry Keel. And that's going to be one heck of a show. I've actually got that one started. I'm going to try and make that one with a Joe Stickley trio. Uh, Saturday, March 18th, Boombox is going to be at five points. Saturday, March 25th, Fat Laces. Saturday, April 1st, Sky Dog, which is a tribute to the Omen Brothers Band, which we were just talking about earlier before we started the show. Um, Thursday, April 6th is Wolf featuring Scott Metzger. And uh, Friday, April 7th, the Tree of Forgiveness Band, which is a John Prine tribute. That's probably your neck of the woods right there. I don't know what you're saying, Billy. What's the implication? Now? I'm just I, my wife likes that kind of music, so I assume you like that kind of music because she likes. Is that a very, that's a very ageist remark you're making. She there. likes that kind of music. I'm just saying that. Uh, and then Saturday, April eighth, Felix uh, Queen Pen Family Wellness Fundraiser. So go Five Points Music Sanctuary. Go to uh, FivePointsMusic.com and, and check out all their upcoming events. Always a good show, good time, great I mean, venue. I mean, it's a superb venue. It really is a lot of a lot of uh, charm to that place. A lot of. Uh, I don't know. The acoustics are good. Everybody has a good time. It's just it's just a happy place to be. Yep, good and, vibe. And yeah, and, and it's a great segue into our guest here today, uh, because we have a musical, uh, very talented musician on here today, and I know he's talented because Caleb Flora said so. Well, the fact he plays with Billy Hurt should be another fair indicator that the guy can rock a guitar pretty good, right? Nothing else matters. The only thing that matters is Caleb Flora. There you go. The only well thing that matters is Caleb Flora has given his seal of approval on it. It makes no sense. I mean, Caleb should almost be sitting in a, in a, in a studio somewhere out in Texas right now, <laughs> just signing checks, kick back with his shit kickers on, sitting up on the desk with, you know, horse shit coming off of him and just, la- you know, just rolling up $100 bills and lighting them on fire to light his cigars. <laughs> the people <laughs> Caleb knows. Uh, he's a phenomenal And the influence character. he has, so... Phenomenal character. So yeah, so today we're being joined by Colby Helms, who is a, 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 a what some would would call phenomenal young musician. And by young, I mean he's not old like Josh Grice. And, uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Sorry, Josh, no, I can't hold him so, back. No, I can't not, apologize. I, we, I apologize for for you. We are not sorry, <laughs> Josh Grice. I invited him to come sit in on this show because I always enjoy having the you know. Another musical mind kind of sitting in the guest co-host chair. Oh, at least you called him a musical mind this time. Well, a mind can be a very tricky thing, too. Uh, so he, he, He's got some insight in this. And I, I asked him to come on the show, and he came up with some sorry excuse about having to watch his kids or something. So I told him that, well, fine, but we're going to spend the first few minutes of the show ripping on your music and... He said you're going to do that anyway, fair point. So uh, He's got you pegged. But that means he listens. He but listens he does. to the show. He yes, does. he does. If he knows we're going to rip his music, then he definitely listens to every single show. So we're going to get him on soon enough again, because I, I know all seven of you are clamoring for him out there. So um, just, to th- <laughs> just to throw y'all a, a bone, we're going to bring him back on here to as a filler episode, I guess. But So, Colby, you welcome. Thank y'all, boys. Um, yeah, uh, Caleb actually gave me a call. I don't know, it's been a little while back, and he said, hey, I, I just told Billy down there at Appalachia Podcast that, uh, you know, I, I want to get you on there. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I've, I've actually listened to a few of y'all's shows, and I was like, well, I, heck, I've actually been, you know, waiting to ask y'all or get in touch with y'all about getting on here, so I, I'm super excited to be here. Um, you know, like I said, when Caleb called me, I was like, heck yeah. And then, you know, Billy texted me just not, not long after that and was like, let's get a date down and, uh, let's sit down and, and talk a little bit. And, uh, you know, I got plenty of stories and songs to share. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and super, super thankful to be on here tonight. A local lad as well. <laughs> and he strolls in. I said, what's in the case over there, Colby? He brings in his guitar case. It's a 19. 19- 57. 1957 Gibson. He pulled it out and I went, I don't think I've ever seen one of those. Yeah. And it sounds sweet. It's a uh, it's a very special guitar to me. Its name is Goldie. That's her name. And uh, the reason for that is uh, it's got those gold tuners on it on the top. And th- those gold tuners are actually for a Les Paul electric guitar <laughs> and, i was gonna say you didn't, those tuners didn't match the guitar yeah they uh but when i bought it like why not when i bought it uh, it had those tuners on there but a lot of people don't realize is that um uh the original tuners that would be on there are like made out of like bakelite basically like the this 1950s plastic and uh they're 
not very good. They they come out of tune. I have another 1957 Gibson that has the original tuners on it, and that thing does not stay in tune at all. This thing stays in tune a, a whole lot better, which I'm talking out of my ass a little bit. Watch me pick up my guitar here and not be able to get it in tune here in a few minutes or something. But Now, were, were they, I mean, Bakelite's one thing. I thought they also were made out of ebony. Now, now, yeah, that that was a long, long time ago. Oh, and originally, dear. originally they were made out of ivory. And uh, you know, I was going to say that too. <laughs> they uh, I actually recently. I mean, I get into that a little bit later. I'm kind of going off on a handle, but I, I went to New York City recently, and I got to go to a vintage guitar shop, which is like a kid in a candy store for me. I mean, that's I'm a history buff, and I love vintage instruments and stuff like that. So I knew I knew what I was looking at when I got in there. And uh, I got to play a Martin, a 1899 Martin that had a ivory, real ivory tuners on it, and a real ivory bridge. And you could tell where somebody had hand carved it. I mean, it was it was quite quite the uh, treat. So, uh, you know, my whole life I've been playing these fake. You know, they got the fake ivory, and it's like in guitar picks. Uh, a lot of them look like tortoise shells, and a lot of people don't know is originally guitar picks were made from real tortoise shells and uh back yep. in the back in the day uh even know, the scratch plates i think I, i'd bet that scratch plates probably well see that's a it's that a may fake. not be that's yeah a fake it's, one. it's the fake and uh you know they they outlawed outlawed that back in the 70s when, when they were doing the whole you know the whole energy you know thing uh i guess and, what, and rightly EPA, so you know the, yeah oh yeah so. uh, you oh, know oh, oh. Well, you know, <laughs> whoa, 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 Here we go. Back it up. Back it up. Back it up. You. Well. You. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like you just sided with PETA and environmentalists and. Oh, no, definitely not with Peter. I can't stand that organization. Well, I mean, I mean bunch he's talking about turtle shells, you know what I mean? Come well, on now. I'll tell you what that's kind of sad, and, you know, I, I know y'all like to get into stuff like this. That it's kind of disappointing, you know. They outlawed Brazilian rosewood in, that's the, ridiculous. in the 70s, and they outlawed and they outlawed the, you know, the killing the tortoises for the guitar picks. But the problem is, is that more uh, Brazilian rosewood and more guitar picks have been made since then than ever, you know, it's just, you know, now they're, people are getting money for it instead of other people getting money for it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, I, the Brazilian hardwood thing, I mean, I get it. I yeah. do. I get it that, that, that if there is, if there's regulation um, with with products, Brazilian hardwood, and it was a renewable resource, you know, and it was responsibly um, harvested, that's a different matter. And in Brazil, it's not. Yeah, it's and not. All, all, it's- all you've got to do is look at a satellite image of the rainforest in Brazil, and it's decimation. It's a bloody shame. Not, not to mention, a lot of people don't even take this into account. You know, Brazilian rosewood back in the day, uh, people wanted it on their guitars just for the fact that it was pretty. You know, D28s, that's just the model of Martin that they made. Uh, they have the Brazilian rosewood. The D18s, they were supposed to be the lesser model, the less expensive model. They were made with mahogany. In my opinion, a, D, a, even a D18 with mahogany sounds fucking way better than a D28 with Brazilian rosewood. It wasn't you. That <laughs> it wasn't me. Congrat- oh, hallelujah. Congratulations. <laughs> hallelujah. Congratulations. Oh, that's a result. So it's really, it's really, you know, this guitar, it's the back and sides are, are all mahogany. And it's got a better sound, in my opinion, than Brazilian rosewood. But, you know, that's, that's my opinion. And that, that, that's the thing about music. You know, everyone will... will will gravitate to their guitar, whether it's a, a Martin, a Gibson, a, a Taylor, you a Taylor, about. which which I which I have great respect for, having never played one before. Um, what a depth of sound that guitar has! Uh, and for a modern manufactured guitar, mm-hmm. um, they're definitely on the money. Yeah, uh, Taylor Taylor really is a, a to me was was had such resonance and depth of sound; it, it was staggering. When you consider the price compared to Martins and Gibsons, yeah, and vintage Martins and Gibsons at that too, so you know, there's there's definitely been some significant advances in some of these acoustic manufacturing processes um, that, that 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 give that depth of sound from something that you would expect to be a significantly more expensive, rare, sought after, um, big name guitar. So well done, Taylor. Whatever you're doing, I think you're doing a great job. Uh yeah, there's a lot of there are a lot of luthiers right now that uh are, I mean honestly the luthier world has expanded in in the last I think 15 years because you know this resurgence of uh, roots music is starting to come back and uh, there's a more of a demand you know I mean 
you get these old retired guys that want to buy a guitar, and sometimes they have the money to get whatever kind of guitar they want. They'll get a custom-built one made, but then you have young musicians that also want specific uh, characteristics and um, specifics on their guitar that other guitar companies can't uh, you know, replicate. Um, like, for instance, uh, a, a buddy of mine, he plays um, old-time music, and... Um, he got this guitar company called Cunningham. They make they make um, these guitars basically spec for spec how Gibson and other car, uh, companies from the 1930s would make them. And his guitar, man, I played that thing and I loved it. It was one of the only guitars that came close to that one, in my opinion, uh, for being a new guitar. And so you're getting this demand of craftsmanship coming back, and I think that's badass. I mean, those the, and that, you know that that definitely, um, in, in my opinion, is a great thing. I mean, the fact that you're getting um, artisans back oh, yeah. to making and, and trying to replicate the old style guitars. Now, uh, the, when I was messing around a little bit um, in this industry, the the trick was finding an amplifier mm-hmm. that that could do multiple sounds. Now, when I say that, um, I can't even remember the name of the darn thing, um, but I always held... Uh, a, a a big torch for a, a Fender Twin Reverb. Mm-hmm. That yeah. was uh, it's just a fantastic valve amp. Yeah. Um. It was it was the go to studio amp back in the sixties. I mean, it's just a fantastic piece of kit. Yeah. Um. But then they would find um certain amps that you could get to replicate this. So this was they, this was the new trend was getting your amp to sound like maybe an old Vox or a Fender Twin. Yeah. You know, and that's just rocking it. I mean, it's just superb valve sound. You can't beat it. Um, but now you're getting these guys coming up, and rather than tweaking the amp, they're actually coming back and remaking, like you say, the custom guitars. Oh, now, yeah. When- my first guitar was a Hofner jazz guitar. Yeah. And that was smoking. Yeah, man. You know, I mean, but uh, I can't even remember what happened to that. Uh Real quick, before we divulge further into Colby over here, I told him before you got here, I want to, I want, I want to hear a story about your music background because that one struck me. We heard about it a couple of months ago. You had told me that you had worked for a studio or something out in California, and I was like, we have got to find <laughs> out the story oh. behind this. And and then I was going to try and get it on 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 the Five Points Music Sanctuary show with Tyler. But that that took off in another crazy, amazing direction. I get a chance to bring it up, but uh, and, and then and then on, <laughs> on the most previous show we had, State of Appalachia, at one point which should be on part two, Chris asked us to recite the the lyrics, the the opening lyrics to one of our favorite songs, and you have some pipes on you too, so. I'm starting to believe. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to name drop him because he didn't show up here today. But Josh Christ once told me that Simon is probably with the CIA, and we're starting to. I mean, think about it. Elvis was probably with the CIA too because they're multi multi talented. Yeah, they can get into places that most people can't. You know, they've got access. Simon can do land, air, sea, music, farming. (laughs) But 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 the CIA conversation saved for another show. Let's let's talk about this music. Music. How, how? How? What is your background in music? It, you know what? It's it's not extensive at all. Um, in fact, my my. But you know an awful lot. What? Oh damn! Here we you're go. You're sitting here carrying on a conversation with him. <laughs> I don't have a clue what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know anything about music other than I like listening to it and I like getting messed up and dancing. That's about the extent of my music. Oh, but right. I like doing it a lot. Well, it it my my twin brother actually is. A very accomplished musician. So, you know, we've always had guitars kicking around and and all that. So, um, but whilst I was out in the Caribbean, um, I ran into a chat. <laughs> um, that's another story in itself because it's quite funny. But I'm not <laughs> going to bore you with that one. But how I actually ran into this chat is is just a hysterical story. But no, I'm not going to go into it now. That's another story for another time. Um, and it turns out that uh, he – and I, I view him – I've got very fond memories of, of him. He's uh, He was a, a mentor uh, of mine. It turns out he was a, a former manager at, at one point in time of the Rolling Stones, David Bowie and Jerry Rafferty. Uh, you know, big names, right? I had no Huge idea. Huge names. Well, yeah, fairly, fairly big. Um, 
and he, I, I, I ended up being pretty much his right hand man. So I was running his boats and planes, and next thing you know, he's got um, a recording project with with uh, a chap called Cam Grant, uh, a, a phenomenally talented uh, musician out of um, British Columbia. Uh, I cannot get it. Yeah, but I mean, ge- genius, genius. Um, and just a, such a talented um, songwriter and musician. I mean, the guy, he rated him as one of, you know, the greatest songwriters. And he tried to resurrect this. And he, um, this is when we were in the Caribbean. So he he got him down um, with Tim, his, his, his good friend, um, a co-musician down to the island. We set up a recording studio in, in Providenciales in Turks and Caicos. And that project went on for the best part of a year. Um, I, it was super cool. What an environment to, 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 and he, you know, he funded this. You know, it was nothing in it for him. He paid the guys. He got engineers down, bought all the equipment, set up the, the, the studio. And, you know, they, they he, it, he was very hands off. He let them do their own thing, which is really, as a musician, is what you want to do. Yep. Yeah. You know, you're not pressured to write, you know, five songs in a week that you've got to lay down, you know, um, demo tracks and all that good stuff. So there was no pressure in that regard. But it, well, then we went out to Europe um, on one of his boats. I was running his one of his mega yachts. Um. And we we got very drunk in, uh, I think it was Naples, Italy, Napoli. Um, very drunk. And he came up with the idea that we we relocate the studio into Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles, which is a very famous part. It's, I mean, it's it's it, that's where all the musicians are. There's a few trendy little um, uh, uh, recording studios there. And we decided we were going to set up a recording studio in Laurel Canyon. In Isn't a, in that a, where Manson was hanging out? Well, there was. We were actually just up the road from where Charlie Chaplin used to live in oh. Wonderland Avenue, and they've written written songs about Wonderland Avenue in Laurel Canyon. It's a very famous place. So we we, we set a recording studio up out there to try and get this project launched, um, or at least you know get it in front of the right people. Uh, producers and yeah. and A and R men and all the just the despicable little barnacles and <laughs> blood suckers that the music industry at that particular time um, was was well renowned for. And um, we kind of cracked it, but you know, it, it just didn't work out. Um, and I'm not going to say why. Uh, I mean, it was just it was the it was the right time, maybe the wrong place, and there was a few things going on. Um, but you know that was that was it. So I was involved in that, um, and I feel very privileged to be able to be involved in something like that. Um, and, I, and I think uh, Robert understood that I had an ear um, for, for around for, around what like what you know time period we're we talking here. When was uh, this? This was, was around two thousand two thousand one, something oh, cool. like that. Um, and I've still got I've still got all the demo tracks. Um, that, that that Cam and Tim did, um, and and even to this day, it's just like they 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 they're timeless. Yeah, you know, and the lyric behind them, the structure, um, uh, the melody, um, everything was there. The bridges, you name it, it. These are these are beautifully crafted songs, um, and I, you know, I, I I that's one of one of my very few regrets is that 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 Cam didn't make it as big as he should have. Yeah. You know? Um, mm-hmm. And that's just, you know, and, and that, this is a common story throughout the music industry, throughout um, uh, the, the the acting um, and arts industry. There's very, very, very few people that deserve to make it, should make it, yeah, but don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and you... you it's almost a tragedy, but sometimes that that industry, when you consider um, the early deaths of of super famous musicians um, in their prime, it becomes actually quite a risky industry to break into. 
So in one respect, I think, you know, I feel very sad that, that Cam didn't get the accolades that I thought and still think that he is due. Um, but it, it, you know, it may have been a good thing for him uh, that he didn't. Um, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, so I mean, that was really what got 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 behind all of that was I was I was working for and very good friends with, you know, the former manager of Rolling Stones and David Bowie. And the thing that used to piss him off really badly was prior, just prior to meeting him. Um, and I actually I'd met him before that, but when I started working for him, I'd actually spent three weeks. Um, with Paul McCartney in um, Parrot Key, um, which is again in Turks and Caicos Islands, uh, with with uh, James and Stella. So you know, and and I am a big Beatles fan, and that used to, that used to chap his ass something wicked because <laughs> I would be that you know, man, you know, I've, I've, Paul McCartney. I mean, you know, one of the greatest songwriters in history, and he he would just look at me. And he, I knew he wanted to beat the living crap out of me because I preferred the Beatles over the Rolling Stones. Hey, I couldn't help it. <laughs> <laughs> so you you actually got so you got to spend three weeks with Paul McCartney's double. That um, is that the most famous person? Because we all, we all know, and there, and there there are a lot of clues. There there are there are a lot of. There's a lot of folklore. Do you know what I'm talking about? When about comes, the death. About the death of Paul yes. that he died yeah. in a car crash back in the allegedly, 60s. Allegedly. allegedly. And and that's also, the White Album has a lot of clues into that as well. You know. Billy Spears and so on. Yeah, I get it. Well, and then I one of them is walking in the opposite direction. Have you ever heard the conspiracy about the conspiracy, though? That they, see, this is this is a, this is an even better take on it. Uh, there's a conspiracy that the that, that the Beatles did this on purpose so they'd sell a whole lot more records because all these people were buying these records trying to oh I think because see it was already a conspiracy Play the record backwards yeah look he's barefoot people walking would out buy, a step on Abbey Road people I mean, would yeah, buy two records all. one to destroy and one to keep and listen to so that's how they they sold double the records with that and let scheme. me tell you I I think he has the humor now uh, again I, I wish I'd been able to meet um, John Lennon. Uh, that just never happened. He was a, a great, a great idol of mine. Um, as was George Harrison. Funnily enough, I mean George Harrison is probably my favorite Beatle. He is definitely my favorite Beatle. George Harrison's definitely. Yep. Um, and I, I was actually on Parrot Key when when Danny uh, Harrison was there, and his father was George was was you know deathly ill, and he had to leave his vacation early off a of Parrot Key. So I, I got to meet um, Danny Harrison uh, as well. So, yeah, I mean, I've got links with the music industry. I am no great musician at all, but I do have a good ear. Um, you know, that's that, that's all there is to it. There's no CIA conspiracy. Uh, <laughs> not not that I'm going to tell you anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll dive in deeper as the stories continue on. But yeah, yeah, it's crazy when you when you talk about that whole story about that gentleman and 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 maybe not it, having taken off might have end up working out well. For it reminds me of this. I don't want to say, lack of better terms, I'm going to say it's a, a Chinese proverb that I recently came across, and it made a whole lot of sense. It said, you know, it was by this Chinese farmer, and, uh, and uh, you know, he had this horse or whatever, and the horse took off, and, and all the village come by and say, oh, man, that's terrible. Your horse took off. And he said, well, we don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. And the next day, the horse came back with two other horses, and all the neighbors came by and said, oh, wow, I man, that's awesome. Now you have, you know, three horses here or whatever and, and a Chinese farmer. So I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. We'll have to wait and see. And the next day, uh, as his son was tr- trying to train one of the horses, he fell off and broke his back. And then everybody in the village came by, you know, and one of the, their condolences and said, oh, man, it's, it's, it's awful that your son fell and broke his back. And he said, well, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. We'll have to see. Well, the next day, the military came by and said, well, now we're um, conscripting all military-aged males to come, you know, in the service and fight the war. 
And all the townspeople come by and say, wow, your son had a broken back. How lucky he is. That's great. He said, well, we don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's, you, yeah. you, you, you just. You just don't know. You don't. You don't know. know. Like, like it, Garth Brooks sang a great song about it back in the day, Unanswered Prayers, if you really want to get to that. Like, yeah. like you, you, you think you know what you want and you think you know how you want things to turn out and work out. But well, the Lord's plan, you know, has got control. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. Exactly. And you're going to turn around and be like, wow, just one one decision in the other direction here or there and what might have life become for us. You know what I mean? It's just, it's. I think now would have been, now would be a great time for Cam. He's now settled. He's got a family. Um, and, and for him to get, you know, some some accolades for his talent, it's a God's gift in my opinion. Um, would be great. Maybe it was done and, and not done uh, at the time because, you know, I think the industry may have, might have destroyed him. It's destroyed many, many people. So, you know, let's look at it with that reflection. It may well be a good thing that he didn't get success it, it, in, in that particular moment well, in time. Well, success as we perceive it. It could exactly. have been successful for him. Right. You know what I mean? You, you just- but as a musician, you always want people to, to enjoy what you're putting out. You know, that's part of being a musician. I don't think it's – it's not musical masturbation, right? That's what I call it. Well, the same thing for us here. We want people to enjoy what we're putting out. Same it's, thing exactly. for all kinds of artists all over the place. But whether you're putting it out for 150 million people and you're winning bukus or Grammys or awards or something, or whether you're doing it for your hometown week in, week out, and you're making enough money to get by and you're enjoying it and have a good – like, success, happiness, it's all – it's all about perception. It really, really is. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and it's crazy. I mean, and, and thank you for sharing that story with us, Simon, because you continue to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Surprise us with each and every week with the stories that you have. I keep and, thinking of stories every now and again. I think, man, I should bring this one on the show, and then I think, yeah, no, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll always find a way to get to them. But back back to Colby here, though. So. So you are, and and I want to get into how you got into music, but before we get to that, I'm going to put the pressure on you. All right. Um, because this, this when, when Caleb Floor hit me up and said, get Colby on the show, uh, and I already wanted to in the first place, he, he just kind of, Caleb brought Local all the Local talent, pieces. right? Local talent, Caleb that's what brought, we're here for. Caleb brought all the pieces together, because you know, I'd seen him perform in everywhere and i'm like man i want to get this kid on here and you know just life continues to happen but when caleb calls and suggests it then i'm like okay well you said you said something there you said something there that's a little bit disturbing that caleb brought all this together and that may be the first (laughs) time he's ever done that well no 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 caleb has brought things together many many a times (laughs) the only time caleb didn't bring anything together when it was caleb that was supposed to bring caleb together He can bring everything else together, but when it comes time to bring Caleb together, it didn't work out so well, did it? It's it's a shot in the dark here. But, you know, Caleb had hit me up and said, you know, hey, man, get him on. You know, he said, you know, I think he's willing to do it. And I said, well, hell yeah. I said, I've been wanting to get him on, you know, because I want to promote musical talent from Franklin County, especially young musical talent, because let's be honest, Josh Grice isn't going anywhere. Um, You know, there's other people around here that could go places and will be going places. Sorry, Josh. I'm not sorry. He should have been here tonight instead of babysitting his kids. I'm not babysitting my kids. What's your excuse? You got grandparents that live <laughs> two minutes down the road from you. Pull your nutsack out of your asshole and come get on the show. Oh. Have a good time with us instead. I'm sorry, Dorothy. <laughs> but let's get back to Caleb, though. When, 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 when I talked to him back and forth about getting Colby on here, his words, now I really am about to put the pressure on you, his words were, he could be the next Tyler Childers. Oh, that's so, no pressure at all. <laughs> Holy crap. I, I, I just want you to respond to that comment by Caleb, and you can thank him or you can tell him to piss off. Well, I mean, I, I appreciate it. I, it's kind of funny, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll enlighten y'all a little bit on, you know, my – so I've been playing, like I, I was telling him, I've been I've been playing since I was uh, – performing out live since I was 15. I, me and my buddy Stuart Werner, we went to high school together. He plays the banjo. We decided we were going to get together because I had played with his dad, actually, at a party, and his dad plays banjo, too. And his dad is one of the 
are very talented artists for the Harwell Grice Band. Yeah, he's the banjo player for the Harwell Grice Band. Okay. Yes, yes. So the band I, is talented. I've seen you play for them as well, I think. I think Maybe I have, outside yeah. of Chaos. I have, I have played with them before Chaos. Yeah. yeah, Josh is the least talented person in that band. He just happens to have the name of it, so he's got some kind of sensible piece of marketing yeah, there. Yeah, well yeah, done, I, Josh. I guess so. Um, but <laughs> yes, yeah, so I started playing with Stuart, and uh, we started playing like bluegrass covers and, 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 and going out and taking it out a little bit. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how it evolved to me playing, but it's kind of funny that Caleb said that I could be the next Tyler Childers because, you know, it's funny how, uh, fads come and go because, you know, when I, I've been writing songs since I was 15. I mean, I, I, I've been trying to tell stories, you know, it has to do with my dad and I'll get back into the backstory on that too, but, but, you know, I've been writing songs since I was 15 and Tyler Childers just happened to be the first guy anywhere even near Appalachia that, made a resurgence now this guy named chris knight i don't know if you ever heard of him but he was he was early 2000s kind of a guy that that uh represented appalachia a little bit but he didn't even get as big as tyler childers got but he was the closest thing to it well chris knight inspired tyler childers to start writing songs if you listen to tyler childers old things where he's on podcasts when he's my age he's talking about chris knight inspiring him so it's kind of funny. I've been writing songs, my own songs, but as Tyler Childers got famous, here I am singing my songs. Oh, people compare you to Tyler Childers. Well, then next off, the next uh, guy that comes up that's big is Billy Strings. I don't know if y'all have heard of him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So here I have long hair, and I'm playing bluegrass, and the next person, oh, you're exactly like Billy Strings now. <laughs> you know, I play a damn concert, and oh, you were Tyler Childers last week. Now you're Billy Strings. And then it's kind of funny, Zach Bryan, and now how he's bigger now. Now everybody said, oh, man, you remind me of Zach Bryan, you know. So it's just kind of one of those things. Yeah, I appreciate it because, you know, all those musicians I just mentioned, I have a lot of respect for all of them. And to get into to be in the position that they're in would be an honor, you know, if I do get to that point someday. So I appreciate him saying that. But, yeah, it is kind of funny how fads come along. You know, Joe Schmo might be famous tomorrow and they'll be saying that I'm like Joe Schmo. So. But the thing with fads is they actually come back round. They never go away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy that you bring that up because I'm sitting there thinking, and I'm thinking about back to the probably the last decade and a half. And, and, and I've always been a jam band for the longest time. I, I love classic rock, huge Zeppelin fan. I like the Stones. The Beatles are okay. Um, <laughs> love Zeppelin again. Uh, you know, even when you think back to, to people like Clapton and all these kind of people, the Almond Brothers, I love uh, Skinner. Um, Widespread Panic is one of my favorites. That Southern rock genre. So for, for me, the country world, I, I kind of felt like country just got to be so corporate and ridiculous. It oh, wasn't yeah. even country anymore that, that I just kind of got fed up with it. But I always like listening to the old stuff, you know, Merle, Willie, Waylon, Hank, Hank Jr. Um, and then you start naming off those bands right there. And I just remember back going back to about 15 years. Well, first it was, and I could have this in the wrong order. So if I do, you know, you super fans, please forgive me. But it was like, you know, for, you know, then you get Jamie Johnson comes yes. along. And they're, oh, like, yeah. and they're like, oh, man, Jamie Johnson, he's the next big thing in music. And then he goes off and wins huge awards. Like, oh, well, he's a sellout. And then here comes the Zach Brown band. Oh, the Zach Brown band, man, they're the next great thing in, in real country music. And then they go win some awards. Oh, well, they're a bunch of sellouts. And then it's, and, and then it's Chris then it's Stapleton. Sturgill Simpson, Chris Stapleton, Dylan it's Tyler Childers, Billy Strings, and every single one of them. Everybody wants to like somebody until they get recognized for what they do, and then they shit on them. I yeah. Mean, well, that's, cool. you know what that is? The British press actually are fantastic at doing that because they will they will lift someone up, and when they've reached the pinnacle as as high as they're going to get, they will rip them to pieces. And I find that it's just such a negative thing to do. Well, you do you do it for the fans, and I think a lot of it's from the fans too because I, I see this kind of stuff going on on Facebook and whatnot. It's like, and it's like people they they. They get a chip on their shoulder for an artist, like, oh, well, I was there with them when they were playing at the Harvester, when they were playing in these backroom bars and stuff. It's like, yeah, you were, and you were there supporting them and cheering them on and hoping that they make it. Say, man, I hope one day he makes it because he's great. And then when he makes it, he'd be like, oh, he's such a sellout. I'm like, what the, what the hell is going yep. on here? Like, you look, just aided look, him by supporting him. You, you, you aided that musician, whatever it may be, to have that level of success now when they start turning up in tour buses and rolls royces and selling out massive stadiums where you know you're looking at a couple of hundred bucks a ticket well then you turn on them and call them a a, a, a sellout like, yeah. I well mean, i'll tell you what like, I, I've, that's how preposterous is that i've experienced it's it's weird being a musician just just 
just being a musician and running into people and people recognize you. And I, you know, I'm because like I've had it to be the other way around where there's people, you know, girl, I mean, I say girl, but guys too. There's people in high school that when I was playing in high school made fun of me that now they see I'm playing at Floyd Fest. Oh, you're playing at Floyd Fest. Oh, we've loved you since the beginning. I was like, well, you called me a, you know, a midget in high school that played guitar and you, now you're telling me that you love me. You know, that's kind of contradictory, but you know, it, I'll take all the fans I can get. I don't, you know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, but success is what you strive for. But does it really matter? Uh, yeah, I exactly. don't. I don't know. And, and, and it's it's for me. Uh, you know, my goal as a musician right now is to get. You know, I'm working on my first album, and uh, you know, it, it's to put out a, a solid record that um, you know it reflects me and reflects what I'm I'm trying to do here, and. Uh, I got a good story about starting my record, so I I tried to I've already tried to record it twice, and both times there's been mishaps. So the first time uh, we had a you know it was a guy in, in the Roanoke music scene that had record you know said he was going to record me and and uh, you know I gave him my I gave him a amplifier as as, as payment because I didn't have any money at the time. It was a Vox amp. It was a very nice oh. amp. and uh, and uh, but anyway. He ended up, things didn't work out with his girlfriend. He had a studio at his girlfriend's house, and he just decided to dip town. And uh, he's now in somewhere else. You know, I won't, I'll be vague about it, but he's somewhere else doing his thing now, and the album never went anywhere. So then the second time, I tried to record with a guy in Richmond, and he was a very, you know, courteous guy to me at first, and, you know, he was kind of bigger in the Richmond music scene. I, and like I said, I'll be very vague on this, too, because, you know, it's kind of rude to name drop people but yeah he he was gonna help me out and love my talent and yada yada went on and on and on but then when it came down to the nitty-gritty he wanted me to sign an agreement for went in the studio and i was going to get him to produce for me but i didn't know that much about him i was just going off of based what he had told me how many points how many points was he after he I, i think it was two and a half or three but but anyway he he we go in the studio but i said i don't want to sign their agreement unless we sit down and go page by page over it he was like, well, don't worry about that right now. We'll just get in the studio. We get in the studio. Bad shit starts happening. My banjo player couldn't come to the gig. They wanted to record us live instead of doing it you know, over click tracks. And then we had a, uh, my bass player wasn't prepared for it, and then we had to bring another bass player. Anyway, the session didn't go right. And, you know, any musician will tell you it's, you know, recording session, you're, you're balancing on a thin line, you know, especially if you haven't been into recording studios a bunch before. And I was relying on this guy to help me through it. And instead, you know, he just was – hurting us every step of the way. So anyway, I go back and I tell him, all right, well, this New York record company has contacted me in this time period. They're an independent label that focuses on every other genre except mine, basically. Like, they've done, uh, you know, indie stuff. They've done emo stuff. Like, the guy that uh, produces, the guy that owns this record label, he helped manage uh, Bruno Mars, My Chemical Romance, Shawn Mendes, a lot of these big, big, way bigger over, makes the whole genre of bluegrass look like a, a speck on a piece of paper. And these guys, you know, offered me this, you know, and I, so I go back to my guy in Richmond. I tell him, look, you know, this is what I've been offered. I have the 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 opportunity to go back and make this album what I want it to be. Because this album, when I start telling you about the details of the album, it'll make sense to why it needs to be a certain way. So I tell him that, and he gets all mad at me saying that I, you know, he trusted me, and I didn't sign the agreement, and I'm doing him dirty, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I broke his trust, and if he wants me to work with him again, then he will needs to get it putting in writing next time and I'm tell like, him to kiss his ass and i was like or your ass i was about to say well then you know that doesn't really sound like i want to be working with you again you know and uh so anyway uh the new this album that uh we're going to do now is actually going to be produced by my good buddy billy hurt who y'all have met right on yes sir. um when i told him this story he got pissed and he said you should have came to me first <laughs> and i and i knew you know i'd made a mistake on that but he's going to do some fiddling on the album as well as my band the virginia creepers will be on the album too uh, adam cecil he's a really great fiddler he's he's been playing around here uh, for a long time in fact next time i come on the show i have to bring him along he's got a lot of great stories he's mid-30s he's been now, around you, here. You, i'm assuming with this album you're not recording it as a live album you're going to click track it. we're going to click track it absolutely this time. that's the um, only way to do it but this album I'll, I'll elaborate on it a little bit it's called colby t helms tales of misfortune and this album How appropriate is, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a really it's a you know, I have a big record collection at home of old records, and I really love records. And now that vinyl has made a resurgence, you know, 
kids are starting to buy vinyl again. People are starting to buy stuff. They want to get collector items that they can or feel like that they have collector items. You know what I mean? So people are putting like inserts in the vinyls now and signing and doing all these special things. And like there's this one songwriter out of West Virginia. His name's Drayton Farley. Well, actually, he lives in Alabama. And his name is Drayton Farley, and uh, he handwrites his lyrics and sells them on eBay. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> and, and, and that's awesome! And like just little shit like that. And his his vinyl when you order it, like it comes like with you know little extra things. And so you know, I wanted to make this album, and it's a concept album because it basically tells my life story. Um, like how I got into music is my my dad. Um, he was a really great guy. He he passed away when I was twelve from cancer, and he him and my mom. They were really old when they decided to have kids. He was 46 when I was born. My mom was 40. Wow. So they waited. Uh, That's right. Around, that, you're like me. My, I'm 40 yeah. and my son is not even one yet. Yeah. So, wow. And so, uh, you know, they, they waited to have kids until they built got their house done and everything. And, and so I was born, you know, and everything. And my dad, he was kind of like a grandpa almost because he's a, was a local legend around here. Steve Helms was his name. A lot of people, listeners probably knew him. And, uh, you know, he had stories – and he would always tell me stories, just stories after stories back growing up here, just hilarious things happen, how it used to be way different, you know, we'd be driving, oh, this used to be here, this used to be here. Anyway, he was a really awesome guy, and when he passed away, you know, I started getting into music because they had a bluegrass band come to his funeral. And my dad used to have parties and have bluegrass bands come, and they'd have old-time jams, and they would do all kinds of cool stuff. And so when I heard that bluegrass band at his funeral, when my dad was sick with cancer, I'd started taking guitar lessons just kind of get it off my mom. my mom. My mom was like, oh, I'll take you to guitar lessons and stuff to get it off my mind. And But after he passed away and I saw that bluegrass band at his funeral, that was when it set into me, this is what I want to do, like – so that's when it, you know, the fire struck under my ass to start doing it. So every day I'd start working on guitar, working on guitar, working on guitar. And, you know, that was when I was 12. And about in three years, you know, my middle school years, by the time I got to high school, I was good enough to, you know, play out live. And, uh, you know, that's when I started doing it, started writing songs. And, um, you Even know. Even so, three years to master a guitar to be able to play live. Yeah. Um, let me tell you that that's quite an accomplishment. Now, it's kind of funny you say that. I started off, I had an electric guitar, like I said, and, and uh, I, I was in theater in middle school. And uh, before one of the drama plays, I asked my drama teacher, would it be all right if I went out and did like a little f- three, four songs on the guitar and sing? Just, you know, I'm just a kid trying to... I go out there, I got this electric guitar, got my amp, everybody's ready. All right, so this song I'm going to play is this, this, and that. I start playing it, and all of a sudden, my damn Vox amp, tube amp goes... Uh-oh popped some bitch just cut off and i said after that i will never play electric i'm going acoustic going back to my roots that was my sign saying i'm meant to be played bluegrass i'm throwing all this electric bullshit away i'm getting my guitar and my, my banjo and i started uh playing claw hammer banjo and mandolin too so those are other two instruments i play and you know love the mandolin by the way when you hear the mandolin on a uh as as a second, uh, maybe, yeah, I'll call it a secondary instrument. Yeah. Behind um, your rhythm guitar. Yeah. And then that mandolin comes in. Um, it's got, it's a unique sound. I love the mandolin. Now, the mandolin is really, is really cool because uh, I'll tell you a little quick story. When I first year of the talent show, it was before I met Stuart, uh, I just got my mandolin and um, I wanted to play it in the talent show. And so I played the mandolin in the talent show. I won it that year on mandolin. But it goes to show you how little people know around here. You know, this is supposed to be Appalachia, bluegrass music. Everybody, everybody said, the kid on ukulele won. The kid on ukulele oh, won. Oh, dear. And uh, no, ukulele nobody, is not a mandolin. No, nobody knew the difference. Malikaliki mucka. There's my cultural appropriation. I knew I'd get it in it somehow. At some point there we go. Now, there go. <laughs> it's, all, it's a little thing I do because I yeah. just piss off, but they're woke people that yeah. want to cancel everything. I give them cultural, cultural appropriation and make them wretch every oh, time. Gosh. So you gave me that opportunity. <laughs> Thank great. you, Colby. Yes, sir. <laughs> I called so, it a ukulele. Good so, Lord. yeah, I, after that, I was like, I'm going to guitar. But, uh, you know, my banjo, you know, my old banjo player, Stuart, he, he plays mandolin with uh, several other bands now. And uh, he's a really great mandolin player, too. Now, my grandfather, funnily enough, was in, in the 1920s. And I've got, I've got a, 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 ver- a very old black and white picture. And he was in, oh, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name, but it was a banjo band, and they made oh, 78 yeah. records. Very awesome. Um, and I still have the picture. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hey, music runs deep and runs it runs through the blood. 
You know, earlier we were kind of, you know, before we got onto this, we were kind of talking a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of how the Chris Stapletons of the world and the Tyler Childers, they, you know, they, they go up and they go down and, and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I, and I was kind of thinking, and the show that we recently went to all together, you, myself, Amos with our wives to go see Crawford and Power at five mm-hmm. points really, really humbled me as far as my music snobbiness because I was a, I, been a, I can, I, I don't want to say music snob ish, not quite a music snob because there's still even some, even modern day country artists that I can still appreciate, like an Eric Church. Yeah. Like I think Eric Church oh, writes yeah. phenomenal songs. Like that song Carolina, I don't even think it's, it's probably a B track. It's probably a B side song and it's my favorite song he's done. Uh, he's an entertainer. Like, Going and seeing Jake and Ethan up there on stage and seeing how Jake worked the crowd and, and how they brought back some old 90s songs and in in that in that sandwich they had, it it, it really it kind of brought – it's all about how much fun you have. Oh, yeah. Look, at the end of the day, like, why, why do people give Nickelback so much shit? If 20,000 people show up to see Nickelback play and they have a good time, who really cares? You know, that, because I, I just – and, and I think Jake and Ethan, they, they kind of play a, a more modern country-ish kind of genre. That's what they do. But at least they, they're writing their own material. But they are writing their they own material. They have their own material. And, that is superb. And, 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 and it is genuine as well. Oh, yes, it's, it is. It's, it's not some dipshit who grew up in a suburb somewhere outside of Nashville who's writing songs about growing up on the riverbank. Yeah. Them two boys grew up on the riverbank. They know it. So even if it is a little modern country-ish, which I'm not a fan of, it humbled me. Good. Because That's a good I, thing. Because, because I went over there and I had a great, great, great time. I said, you know tell what? You what? It's all about the time you have. I tell you what, so did they. They, they had, oh, what a... And speaking yes. of five points, Colby, you got to play... I played there Tyler's, twice. You got to play Tyler's birthday yeah. dash, right? Yeah, the first time, I'll talk a little bit about five points and why I love them. I mean, um, the first time, like, I'll tell you... I'll, a bunch of my music friends in Roanoke and, and, and stuff that have, you know, helped me get into the Roanoke scene, you know, they've been bugging Tyler, oh, you got to get this kid, you got to hear this kid, you got to get this kid. Well, then I, one day I, I went to one of the shows, I just walked up to him and, and shook his hand and met him, and we got to talk, and he said, you know, I've been hearing a lot of good things about you. I want to I wanna promote you and, and lift you up. And he said, when I have a bigger band that fits your bill come through here, you know, we'll let you know. Well, Town Mountain, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they to play with Tyler Childers and stuff. Yeah. They they came through, and uh, he put me on the bill, opening up for them. Well, that right there, boom, that got me a shit ton more fans than I had before, and I, I appreciate him for doing that. And then, after that, to top it off, he goes, you know, I'm more of a, you know, I'd like to do a birthday bash every year and usually get a Grateful Dead fish band. That's Dude, what he was telling me. a huge fish band. He, he, yeah. he was telling me about all that. He said, this year... We're going grass. I was like, "Oh yeah!" And so I was, like, I was super stoked. Right and uh, he, he, I got got my band to headline, and uh, we had a sold out show. It was awesome. Let me let me sow a, a a seed here, if I may. You're coming up. You want to do a new album. You're going to click track everything. Throw in one live show or one live song that you record at Five Points. Yeah, that, that would be cool. I think that would be awesome. Well, it'd be good all around for everybody. You oh, know, absolutely. Especially, you know, because. Because once again, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording here tonight, before you showed up so gracefully on time. Um, the first time I've been late, Billy, and you're going to rag on me. I was worried. I was genuinely, I even told him, I said, look, I'm worried. Because Simon typically doesn't, not only does he not not show up early, but he'll at least call ahead of time and say, hey, I'm five minutes away. And I called a couple of times and I told him, I said, I'm about to call his wife and make sure he didn't get pulled over or something, get in a confrontation with a cop and get hauled off to jail or something. You know, I'm was- always very polite with our law enforcement officers. <laughs> I'd like to think I, I, I hold them in equal respect. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm moving on. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that's what I was kind of worried about. But yeah, but I, we were talking about how, how much of an impact – Tyler has and what a phenomenal venue he's got. Going oh on yeah, there, you know? well the acoustics and, there. You know the I acoustics. Mean, a, being a musician, I just I, I just want you to explain to the people who are listening who might not yet have made their way to Five Points, despite despite us, you know, pushing them in that direction. How dare you not take our advice? But <laughs> yes. as a musician, you know, well I I look at it like this. See if you compare if you compare 
um you know venues and i, I and i you know i'm not going to throw other venues under the table or anything but i'm you just leave saying, that to Simon but I, i'm just saying if you if you were to compare <laughs> venues uh there's a reason why some venues you know around here are more or less dying and other venues are growing because places like five points promote the arts they promote the culture they tell they they want to tell you right there look you're coming to see a show and this is an interaction between the band and the audience so when you're in that room you're in that interaction and you know it's just you and them and tyler makes sure you get that connection you know he's you know got the the whole the thing going on where you can get the vests and, and you know the you know people that have hearing disabilities can come in and enjoy the show and let me tell you i saw some people wearing the vest and they were in it just like the rest of the people and do that that makes me feel good you know any any i can reach more people that way and and you know i have people coming up to me and saying man this was an intimate show and that and that's something that also the five points is so great at you know they got they they got the balcony scene but they got the stand-up room the crowd feels like they're with the band and that's if you have the separation you know in other venues where they put uh like a vip seating up front it makes it feel like there's the band and there's the crowd and there are two separate things and they're never going to come together and you're never going to feel like you really just got to experience something until you break that boundary and you get that I i think tyler is a very unique individual when it comes to the arts and what he's doing there yeah um almost on the verge of revolutionary yeah, the guy's a genius. I, I, I tend to agree. Yeah. I tend to agree, and and you're never going to have a bad time over there. And yeah. and like you said, it's all about bringing the audience and 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 the venue and and the crowd all together and, and making them as one and lifted everybody up. I mean, and, and 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 when they walked away that night, I think after Jake and Ethan walked away off that stage tonight, that night, I think they both had it in their minds that. And, and me personally, I think both of them are going to go very far in the music world. Oh, yeah. I think that yeah. Jake and Ethan have no the, question. I think they have the talent. I think they have the motivation, and I think they have the skill to become as big as like a Brooks and Dunn. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, well, yeah. they, they they have the charisma. Really, they have the charisma, the charisma and stage presence, and and that is the difference. And I think that after walking out that night, I think they both probably. And I'm almost 100 percent sure that they that these were their thoughts were. Um, well, the we're going to come back here, no matter how big we get, we'll always come back to this venue to put on a show as long as it's still yep. here and try and give our hillbilly brethren an opportunity to come see us in an intimate intimacy that yeah. you, 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 you touched on that intimacy, man, that that's what it's really all about. That place was thumping. I mean, you can play in front of 50, you know, 50,000 people at a, at a football stadium or 20,000 people at a basketball arena. But the love and the appreciation and the mm-hmm. excitement that was there that night for that show, you're not going to – it's going to be so hard to replicate no matter how big the audience is. And same thing for Colby over here, you know what I mean? Like, he makes it big. He's out there selling out. Well, they told a very good story, and it was, it was you know, an interlude to one – it was I think it was a prelude, actually, to um, one, of their, their, uh, one of their songs. And they told the story. They were, they were in the process of – um, signing a contract, or at least you know, having going through the introduction, and apparently the A and R man, little snot that he was, uh, didn't like their second verse. And I'm like, number one, you're an A and R man. Best you shut the hell up. <laughs> and um, you know, I, 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 the, the arrogance of that just blew me away. So to me, having a producer through the Richmond experience is one thing. Having a good engineer, yeah, that's the guy that's going to make the difference. Yeah, so it's the engineer. The producers are one thing. Yeah, they can guide you and they can put you down certain avenues. But if you've got a good engineer behind you, um, those are the guys that the are worth engineer. their weight in gold. Oh yeah, you and uh, this time we're going to do it right. We're going to be probably most. I mean, it's almost one hundred percent sure now. We're going to be probably recording up at uh, in in Maryland uh, with our good buddy Tom Minty. He uh, he's recorded all of Billy's albums. And uh, he's a well versed in the in the old time and bluegrass world, and so we're really excited about that. Um, That's I, fantastic. I, I mean, you know, keep going, keep plugging at it. Yeah, don't ever quit. Yeah, man. You know, you you you've got it. You know what's going on. Well, while we're talking about it, go back and listen to episode ninety, which we did feature Billy Hurt on there. It was one of our most popular shows yep. that we have ever done, huh. and 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 people, they, they, you don't think about that kind of stuff because. 
outside of Franklin County, a lot of people might not know who Billy Hurt is, but in the music world in Nashville and these big places, everybody knows who he is. And Franklin County especially knows who he is. So despite the fact that we've had Grammy, we've had a Grammy award winning banjo player or a Grammy um, nominated banjo player and a Grammy award winning fiddlist on this show before, uh, Jim Van Cleve, you know, the Billy Hurt show and, and, and granted it's because we are Franklin County. Billy Hurt did every bit as good as that show, if not better. Um, oh, he threw a great little set up on the, um, he, the, 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 the the porch of the cabin for, on July, the July 3rd, party. July 4th. That was superb. Yeah. I mean, I was so privileged that he, you know, came up and did it. That's and all well that, done, Amos, for putting it, that together as well. Some of the best. Superb. When I when I talk to these guys, I'm like, you know who Billy Hurt? Yep, absolutely. All these guys, all these guys know who he is. And, and it... it Go back and listen to that show because Billy is a phenomenal talent and he's a great, great musician. Um, and, and he's a great uh, student of the arts as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. So real quick, but, but, but before we get to, to anything else, I'm, I'm kind of curious. As, you know, you talked about the kind of music you play and the genre you're into. <coughs> who are some of your influences? Who are some of the people? And, and I, I want to know, uh, you know, Album wise, mm-hmm. but if you say that, you know, no. Um, but I also want to know locally as well because I know every single person we've had on this show that has been a local musician has had somebody else locally that they kind of followed or looked up to. You know, even like you know Corey Hundley w- was a Matt Powell and Kyle Forey was a Corey Hundley <laughs> and uh, Josh Grice looked up to Ringo Starr. I'm saying we've got. <laughs> Every, every, you know, everybody's everybody's got their own. So, so for you, what you know, you're talking about kind of what got you involved in it, but but who are some of your influences to get you to where you are at this point in time? Well, I, I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, my my local influences as well as some of my uh, excuse me, some of my 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 bigger influences, I guess. But I, I'll say it like this: when I started playing the guitar, you know. Uh, Bill, like I, I have to bring him back up again, but you know Billy Hurt around here. My, my dad, you know, used to do work for him and stuff. Helped him work on his house and his cabin, his barn stuff. And uh, you know, he was kind of like a lit, like a myth. Like, oh, that's Billy Hurt. Oh, that's uh, da, da. well. Then when I started, I went to see their band actually when I was probably fourteen, fifteen. Uh, just in high school, I remember because I, I wore a big a big ass cowboy hat to go see them at uh, Farum College. They did some showcase at Farum College, and that was you know at the time I was thinking to myself, man, that's what I want to be doing. You know, if I ever become an accomplished musician, it'll be playing guitar for him. And it's hilarious because I play guitar for him all the time now. That's and then, great. You know, but uh, you know, he when I started hanging out with that crowd with with them, you know, see, uh, we call ourselves the the freaks because all the, all of the musician friends in that clique, these guys are the guys that have have uh, opened my spark because I was already a big history buff. But see, this is the thing: all those guys are history music freaks, and they know they can tell you the you, you know the year this song came out and the year this song and which artist recorded it first and which artist recorded it after and who changed the words the first time and who changed the words the second time and all these guys they all know that and you know it's a, it's a big click of them you know and in that old time world that got me into wanting to listen to old music and and so I went back you know I started listening to all these old the, you know Blue, Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys it's kind of like we were me and uh, Billy were talking earlier about the Grateful Dead starting a, a subgenre you know the Grateful Dead didn't really mean to start a subgenre that they did they didn't even mean to start a jam band they were just 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 flowing creatively and you know in the beginning and and at Bill Monroe when his band came out at the Grand Ole Opry in 1945 it was called the Bluegrass Boys they were a country band they were marketed as a country band there was no such thing as bluegrass music they were taking old songs like these old Jimmy Rogers songs that are really slow like ballad style songs and doing them really fast and you have the the three finger banjo style that shit was like rock and roll to these people because they had never heard anything like that and that was before rock and roll it's 5 10 years before rock and roll became a thing so people don't realize now when they think oh old traditional bluegrass bluegrass isn't a tradition it came out in the in the 40s it's about the same age as rock and roll and people don't realize that old time music and bluegrass are two separate things you know blue- well, i had no idea i mean that's an eye opener yeah. for me but hey 
I'm the farnie. But me, I like to, you know, I people, I, there's people in the bluegrass and old time world that when people don't know shit like that, they jump on them. Oh, that's the reason that bluegrass sucks now is because people don't know. No, I said, that, you know, I as, as a musician, I, I like to tell stories and I like to enlighten people and teach people as, as much as I can because, you know, at one time I was stupid and I didn't, you know, I didn't know that either. And you have all these people trying to talk history. A lot of times you can tell when they don't know their stuff. You know that's that's a that's a good way right there. Uh, good pointers when people talk about traditional bluegrass and act like that it's this thing. No, it's 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 a it was a progressive music when it came out, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, Western Swing, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. I learned how to play Western Swing style guitar from uh, watching Brennan Ernst, who plays with Billy Hurt's band. Uh, Billy, he does old time stuff, but he'll also switch it up and do swing and jazz when he has Brennan to play piano. Uh, he's probably talked a bunch about Brennan, but uh, he plays piano and guitar. Well, I started watching him play those swing chords, and you know, people have always said if you can play jazz, if you can play swing, then you can play any genre. Yes, and indeed. that and, and that I, and that is I thoroughly agree. And that is because it's the mu- it's the musician of musicians, you know, that play it. And you got to understand music to understand it, and and so I wanted to become not necessarily better because if you think about musicians and guitar players, their goal is to be flashier or better than the next person. My goal was to know more. I wanted to know more and to like be just you know higher on the totem pole as far as knowledge. Because if you uh, one way uh, I also look at it is think about your heroes. Like if you were talking about modern guitar heroes, you know the people that or my peers, they look up to people that are alive. I look up to people that are dead because these people that are alive, I want to know their heroes, and then I want to know their heroes' heroes. That's how you expand. And um, so, you know, I've listened to a lot, a plethora of old music from jazz to blues to country to Western swing, and and that really has helped shape my music and make it a little bit different than, you know, let's say your average guitar strummer. And there's a lot of them, and that's – you know, I, I, that's another thing I've tried to strive to be is a little bit different, unique, because there's so many people that strum and sing the guitar, you know, it's kind of a tough, tough niche, as you were saying. A yeah. Niche. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was a big fan uh, back in the day, and it, these were, whilst I was, was playing that cursed game of rugby, on a Saturday night after a rugby game, we'd all wander off into a part of South, South London, and uh, into a, a, a an old boozer that had a stage in the back, uh, and listened to trad jazz. And let me tell you, that's awesome. those were some of the the most talented musicians I've ever seen. You know, and then you're harking harping back to the likes of Chris Barber and Acker Bilk and all of that. So mm-hmm. trad jazz is just awesome. Um, but there you go, another another little shocker for Billy to. And- Put in his Rolodex going, man, this guy, what the, where did I dig this? Yeah. Fucker up from. It's it's kind of funny, I'll add C- this, you're talking about, L- <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about uh, London, it reminds me of another thing that helped me uh, in becoming on the performer side of things, as I was elaborating on this a little bit earlier, I was in theater and choir uh, throughout my school years, and uh in in theater, uh, Franklin County High School. This has been several. Let's see. I was a I was a sophomore. We got elected to go to the Edinburgh Arts Festival and perform. And so we got to take a trip. We flew to London. We stayed in London, and then um, we got to sightsee around there, you know. And then we uh, we went to Edinburgh. We stayed at the college there, and and uh, got to perform and at, at, at a church that was built in like the 1500s, and and they they set they shut the whole city down for this festival and they have all these people from all over the world come and perform different plays and stuff but getting to do stuff like that man that really made me want to be on stage i mean getting to go to another fucking country and and get on stage and that 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 right there got me to spark to where man i want to be doing this exact same thing except instead of dressing up like a damn bird and jumping around on stage i want to have a guitar around my neck and be doing doing the same thing (laughs) heather Heather and i went to um edinburgh maybe five years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we happened to go to the Royal Military to two there at the Edinburgh Castle that it coincided with the, uh, I forget what festival it was, but, you know, everyone was out in the street in the old town mm-hmm. uh, of Edinburgh, just below the castle. Um, and what a fantastic place that was. It was, it was just embracing culture, arts, um, humour. Uh, it, it was everything there. It, it was, it was and, a great I, place. You might, you might hate me for saying this but i when i went to when i went to you know europe or europe but uh you know britain uh 
London was a whole lot more like New York City for as like people were a bunch they, of cooks. They were they were trying to get they were trying to get somewhere and you were in their way type thing. But then when I went to Edinburgh, it was like going to the south. Like uh-huh. like the people of Edinburgh, they would just sit there and talk your ear off, just help you, friendliest fucking people I've ever met. And and a lot of things, the city was way cleaner. People took care of it a whole lot more. Oh, Edinburgh is a, a beautiful, beautiful I, city. I think that's really cool, you know, when people you see people that, that appreciate a place that's historical like that, and they take care of it. I mean, the people that live there are happy to live there, if that makes sense. I think that was really cool. I mean, I, I got to go to the uh, the Edinburgh military parade. They do like a big That parade. was the Royal Tattoo at the castle. Yeah. I went to yeah. that. I was, yeah. I was there five years ago. That, that, that was that was, was awesome. phenomenal. And Wait, mass- it was five years ago? It was, it was, well, they do it every year. I know, but I, what Royal, if we were there at the same time? That would be hysterical. <laughs> that would have been something. Because they do the mass pipe bands. And let me tell you, the hair stands up on the back of your neck. Yeah. I mean, when you, oh dear, you go into battle with a load of pipers, good luck. Well, I know, and, and, and you talk about something that I think people should really invest some time into as far as understanding the history of bluegrass music. And 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 I know Billy Hurt spoke about this a little bit on, on the show we had with him. And I know fellow musician Joshua Grace talked about this on the first show we ever had him on was that there are a lot of jazz influences that go into bluegrass. Like oh, absolutely. There, there are a ton of jazz and, and even and even it goes back to like the Irish days. There there are a lot of old Irish tunes oh, yeah. that ended up, you know, Bluegrass is a melting pot of, of, of different influences. I mean, you have, you, you know, the, 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 you know, a lot of people don't realize this. Another cultural music that's in, in this region is Piedmont blues. Uh, you know, the African American, you know, population that has just been here ever since the Civil War, they have developed their own cultural thing. And, and it's kind of funny. A lot of these old folk songs, they, they you know, there's like a, almost like a white version and a black version, but they're both, you can tell they're the same damn song. And, uh, you know, these black guys, they were using thumb picks, whereas white people were using, you know, and you start to see a lot of these influences where you could tell that they were taken from some of these blues guys. Um, a lot of the bluegrass songs that you hear come from old blues songs, that get old thump, and, you know, the, the thumb style comes from African American influence. You know, they, they, they developed, you know, into the banjo, which, which a lot of people, you know, that's kind of a controversial topic because a lot of people like to act like that. You know the bluegrass banjo was stole from African American heritage, but that that's that's bullshit because you know the banjo was already developed by the Civil War. It was already developed by the Civil War. It, it, it was a popular instrument. So by the 1920s, that's you know that's enough difference. That's that's enough time span between me. That'd be like me saying that I knew it's a generation. It's it's over a generation, and yeah. and so it, it it morphed into a different type of music, a different instrument. And black and white people both played the banjo simultaneously. You know, in swing in um, uh, string bands, I meant to say, in the 1800s, all the way up through the 20s, and the minstrel, the minstrel performers, which were uh, uh, the, they would be white people that would dress in blackface, and they would play the banjo. They, Governor Northam. They, they, um, you know, they popularized the banjo and and helped African American music get reached to a wider audience. The thing is, is that a lot of the white people wouldn't listen to black music, but you know who would? The white musicians. Yeah. They still appreciated it, and they they elevated African American music by taking those songs and 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 making them more popular to mainstream. Which is yeah, really jazz, good. blues, and then all of a sudden here comes Elvis and rock and roll. Well, well, they're. Uh, it- this is why you and I work together so well, because I was <laughs> getting ready to mention Elvis. I was going to say there is a strong contingent out there that will argue that Chuck Berry is actually the king of rock and roll and not Elvis Presley. Um, I hold Chuck Berry in the greatest of esteem. Do you, let me, let me ask you both this, since y'all both, since you're musically inclined and, and Simon is to some degree, but also a huge Beatle fan. Do you remember the, I can't remember which show it was on. But John Lennon and Chuck Berry played a song together on, uh, I want to say, yeah. it was kind of like a late Was night. it Long Tall Sally? Yeah, I think so. It was the one that Yoko Uno screamed in yeah, the Yeah, and you can like see, and ring. you can see, and, yes, and I know Chuck, exactly what you, yeah, Chuck, and Chuck, Chuck Berry's face, he was like, they turned her off. get this <laughs> off of stage right They, they turned her mic off, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't God know if they did that. that or not, but I know the yeah, look on did. his face was like, get her off of stage. Dude. Chuck. Dude, you are a world class musician. 
that, it may not have, it may not have been Long Tall Sally, actually. Ass. It was um, Roll Over Beethoven, perhaps. Yeah, it was one of those classics, maybe, yeah, something like no, that. Or, or it was, um, 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 which is big one? Johnny Be Good. Johnny Be Good. Yes, Johnny Be Good. Be good. Yes, that's, yeah. I think that's song. Oh, man. That's hilarious, though. That's that. But I mean, American music is the is 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 pretty much. I mean, you know, I I don't like to be the kind of guy that's like America's better than everybody or whatever. But America does have the best music because we have so many influences from other countries and, and other parts of the world that all came here and melted together. And you get all these, you know, li- just life happening, and just life makes folk stories and makes. Folk well, it music. was Bill Haley that introduced rock and roll to the UK. Yeah, along with Chuck Berry. Yeah. You know, uh, Chuck Berry, you know, he's no, you know, I, the thing about Chuck Berry versus Elvis type thing is, is, is the thing that, that I like to point out is, you know, Chuck Berry, yeah, he, he could dance, he could sing, but he was also playing the fucking guitar and he was a badass at it. I mean, he, he popularized the, the distortion on the electric guitar, which that, that right there, that, that alone, you can thank rock and roll, thank him for rock and roll. There was, um, who's the, uh, Rolling Stones, um, oh, for goodness sake. It was, it was to do with Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry would, because he was such a free spirit, um, trying to play a live show with Chuck Berry, apparently, was a very tough thing. I mean, he, he would just, oh, you know, just go off on a tangent somewhere else. And um, who's the uh, the Rolling Stones guitarist? His name Keith is Richards. Keith, Keith Richards. Richards. Keith Richards said, you know what, I want to sort this shit out. Um. And he said, "I want to do, I want to do a, a tour or a concert with Chuck Berry, but I want to try and keep Chuck Berry on the straight and narrow, and stop bursting off at a tangent after a chorus or pinging off somewhere else." Apparently, he because he was a free spirit. Yeah, he just did his shit and what, he didn't, I, didn't give a. Did, have you ever heard the story about Keith? Keith Richards got punched in the face by Chuck Berry. Actually, he oh. uh, he uh, he came he came into his dressing room. And Chuck Berry's guitar was just laying out on there. And, you know, Keith Richards, it was kind of funny. You know, he thought, he just, he said he said in the interview, you know, you get to a certain point when you're a rock star when you don't think that you need that that permission anymore to do stuff. And he was like, I walked up, I just walked up to the guitar and I picked it up and I was just looking at it. Said he turned around to meet Chuck Berry's fist. Chuck Berry didn't say <laughs> shit to him. He just punched him in the face. Straight up, didn't say a damn thing to him. Picked his guitar up, put it back in the case. <laughs> he he apparently was on. A, it was in the south of France. This was Keith Richards was off his head. I mean, Keith Richards is very good at doing that. <laughs> and he got on a. I think it was a scarab or um, some form of go faster boat in the port of Cannes, and didn't really know what was going on. Anyway, he he took the wheel off. He went screaming round the bay, came back to the dock and just smashed and just destroyed this. Go faster, boat! And apparently, he got off unhurt. And he, whoever was there said, "You know, you all right? What what on earth happened?" He goes, "Yeah, everything's good, man. But I just didn't know where the brake was, man." <laughs> <laughs> and that's on a just boat. on a boat, you know. Okay. Well, Keith Richards is a new Betty White. It's like, okay, you have now, and and Betty White. We understand because women typically live longer than me and how Keith Richards has managed and Mick Jagger as well, how they have managed to survive pickled all these years. Pickling still playing music. Think about pickling. Can keep it in a job if you pickle it. Wow. <laughs> Just saying. Whatever they have done though oh, to manage Lord. to stay relevant. I mean, they were still producing big songs back in the 90s that were charting, but here we are in the 2000s, and they're still touring. Um, I would give anything, anything. Like, I even told Tara when we first got together, I said, look, we don't have any kids right now. If something happens and, you know, Led Zeppelin decides to get back together, like Robert Plant and Jimmy Page can somehow manage to bring it together, and maybe they'll play at Wembley for one night. We're traveling to Wembley. I don't care what we got to pay. <laughs> no, I- we, we will we will empty our bank. And, and I always thought, man, it's, it's got to happen. It's got to happen. They, they have to understand how much the world needs something like this, and they just never made it happen. But I did yep. get to go see Robert Plant. You know, play in uh, Richmond a few years ago. That was one of the gifts my wife gave me for for a holiday. Forgive me for not remembering which one it was, but um, 
Yeah, and I got to go see him play uh, the Lemon Song. I think going to California, which is one of my favorite Zeppelin songs of all time. So I, I got to see a few Zeppelin songs. I actually got to see Robert. I mean, a legend, a legend. I mean, just how they revolutionized music. Like, like the Beatles and the Stones were before Zeppelin, right? Yeah. But the Beatles and the Stones also were like that. Sock hop poppy stuff back their yeah. first couple of albums with that sock hop poppy do up do you know that kind of stuff. Led Zeppelin came straight onto the scene and just smashed people's it. faces. There was yeah. no there was no sixties version of NSYNC or Backstreet Boys. It was straight out of the gate, just boom. I mean, yeah. even and, even and, even what came before the Yardbirds. I mean, they were already yeah. oh amazing. Oh, the Yardbirds had uh, Jimmy Page. Who was their third guitarist? Beck, John Beck, and yeah. uh, Jeff Beck, yeah. Jeff Beck, Jeff Beck, and Eric Clapton. Yeah. They, they were, <laughs> I mean, Eric Clapton, John Beck, and Jimmy Page were your three guitarists over your time frame, and nobody can barely remember you. Yeah, they can't because yeah. the Yardbirds they were like those original. Rolling Stones and 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 a bit like Cream, you know, they were a mega yes. band. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my last, I think my last mega um, stadium band that I saw was the Rolling Stones at Wembley doing their Voodoo Lounge tour. Wow. It was off the chart. But I did get to see Oasis in Rome with Heather. And that was smoking. Yeah, we saw we saw them land at the airport in, in Fumicino at 11 o'clock. We happened to be there because we were landing in a private jet too. And next thing you know, coming down the concourse, there's a whole Oasis band. It was just like, what is going on? Amazing, they were huge back in the mid nineties. Oh yeah, it huge. was it like, was they a were, massive deal. They, they were they were overtaking every middle school dance <laughs> that there was to be had. But I that remember. wasn't necessarily a huge stadium. It was a big stadium. It was a stadium in Rome, um, but but the one at Wembley with the Stones was. Were you still living in England? And did you attend Live Aid back in 86? I'm afraid I didn't. Uh, I was living in England at the time. How big was that from from, from your perspective? How big Massive. Was it was, if you weren't there, uh, you, you missed something. And I, I have to admit it, I missed something. I can't think what I was doing. I've got no idea. It was probably rugby or women related. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> what, what was... Was the the set that Queen played as well revered as yes. everybody made it out to be? Absolutely. I mean, just came took out the on roof stage off. and took the roof off because that was the first time that Freddie Mercury had been been back with Queen and for a, a while, a couple of years, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yep, and he'd already had his AIDS diagnosis at that time yep. as well. Yep. And and that was a whole that was a whole live AIDS. I think was, I think the film. Uh, Bohemian is it Bohemian Rhapsody? Yes, I think the film phenomenal um, film. That's the last. It's, it's film. a superb film. The last film Tara and I watched before Claire came into this world, my daughter. There you go. That was the last time. And I, I think that was a fair depiction. Phenomenal movie. Of, of of how that went down. That's a fair depiction. Yeah. Really was. Oh, yeah. Because you never can tell. You really never can tell. Um, unless you were there or unless you have. And I was only four years old at the time. But, um, you know, Queen just. I, 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 Stole that, the that, show. That, that's another. Stole the show. That's another band, a British band that uh, I think kind of falls falls behind the Zeppelins and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles of the world, and to get forgetting about. I don't think a lot of people even know Queen are a British band. I think a lot of people think they're American, but of course they all are because th- they don't sound like Simon when they're singing. Yeah, they never do. <laughs> they always sound American when they're singing. Why is that? Oh, Simon? God, blimey, Why old chap! That? Why is that? Why do they all sound? Because, because you know, we've well, got a bigger but when base. You, but when you hear Oasis, you can clearly tell they're an English band. Yes, um, I think with the Beatles there was there was certain Americanisms in in their enunciation, because it flows better in in a lyric and a song, with you know certain enunciations of British words, so it becomes poetry, and the poetry with certain American inflections, um, is probably more soothing, with a melody that's behind it. It's an interesting thing. There's a, there's a lot of British bands that will sound as though they're an American band with some of their enunciation. And, and and that's, you know. Well, I can say this about American rock music too. Colby, maybe you can as well. 
But I can also say, but what the hell happened to British rock? Because you had the greatest. I mean, Zeppelin, the Beatles, the Stones, Queen, even Oasis, Ozzy. I mean, Countless Cream, oh, Clapton. Yeah. You had the cream of the crop. And then the Who? The Who, yes. We're, 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 Wasn't the biggest fan of the Who, the, funnily when enough? When is the last time we had a great English rock band? The only will, one, will the only one would one be again? Oasis. Will we ever have one again? Will we ever have a, a great American rock band again? You know, I, I, I'm struggling to say whether we will because I think the way the industry is going now, whether you call them a rock band. Well, one that we'll recognize. You know, there are probably great rock bands out there that are playing right now that yeah. just don't get the airplay because they don't sell that corporate rock. Right. I, I'd say that, and he's not a rock band by any stretch, but I would say the musical genius and talent of Ed Sheeran um, is pretty much up there. The guy's untouchable. Yeah, you're not going to, I mean, as far as, because if you look at, you know, what makes music better, that it has to be something different that came before it, but still accessible enough to the audience that they like it. Yeah. And Ed Sheeran does that. I mean, he's he's different, but at the same time, he's appealable to the audience. So, I mean, you know, it. I think it's safe to say that we, there is chances we could see another band, another great American rock band, but we're not going to know it until it falls on our lap. I mean, yeah. it's hard I to. I don't pre- think you can predict it. You know, there's there's always been the wannabes, you know, that didn't quite make it for whatever reason. Um, I, th- I I firmly believe we you will see these mega groups again. You know, I th- I think they're there uh, because you've got everything now is it's it's down and I and I can't stand it. If you use a th- synthesized drum machine, I want to kick you in the nuts. All right, because you want to hear the imperfection, right? Which is why everyone or where a lot of people are going back to vinyl, um, because of that imperfection. You cannot you cannot replicate vinyl, and what you do with and 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 here's something that I'd like your opinion on is that none of us own our music anymore, right? We don't own it. It's I. It's it's whatever we we've downloaded it. We don't own that shit. It's 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 been. Well, before you, the internet, you lose you know so owned, much. Do you know who owned who owned the Beatles before the internet? I don't even. Do you know, know? Do you know the answer to that question? It, 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 somebody bought them, didn't it? Who was it? The King of Pop. It was Michael Prince? Bloody Jackson, and because and Michael Paul Jackson, Ma- Michael, Michael Jackson, because Paul them. McCartney told him how to do the publishing and points game uh, that isn't quite so prevalent now because the recording industry has has over the last 20 years has certainly t- been turned on its head um because well, with because of because of streaming, downloads streaming napster, yes. you know Na- napster was the big one you weren't even alive on napster yeah. that is right. wild That's that insane, is wild. he was not even alive when but napster they they they, they destroyed and and for the right reason because there was there was only a few people that controlled uh, the dynamics of the music industry and when I'm talking about dynamics of the music industry I'm talking about distribution so the distribution um was where all the deals were made and this is where a lot of massive bands lost an enormous amount of their wealth from their talent down to little snot A&R men um the the big record companies and distribution and that was the only way that you could get the music out there is by getting it played at certain radio stations and it was in certain record shops because that's where you went to buy and own your music and now you just download it. And the downloaded music, um, let me tell you now, has lost so much of its depth and quality in the download. Yeah. Um, if you... Oh, it's lost to soul. It, it, it absolutely soul because it when has. I was in high school, and and even then when it was CDs, but the CDs kind of, you know, it, it's it's very similar to the vinyls. It's very similar to the cassettes, it, or whatever. And the fact that you had to go to the store to buy it, you had to save up your money. You had to say, "Man, I really like this band. Man, I really want to give them. I'm, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to drive there. I'm going to purchase it." And I'm going to go home with it. But that was quality it control. It wasn't just like, doom, got it. It but was it, quality control. You're also losing, like we were talking about before, you're also losing that intimacy now with the downloads. 
you know, you could just download whatever kind of song you want at any time and listen to it. And just as quick as you download it, it will not it just as quick as you downloaded it is just as quick as you'll forget about it. You know, as long as the next song comes. Along. But, but I, I've got an issue with the quality. Yeah. Um, because you are not hearing that depth of of sound that you would get on a vinyl well, or a CD. It's like it, it's exactly why I wore the shirt today. Uh, this is the, the 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 band of all bands for that exact example. Uh, uh, Steely Dan. You know, they spent countless hours in the studio throughout from 1970 to 1979. They spent pretty much their whole life in the studio, and they hired all these different musicians throughout the years to play on their albums. And they made all these countless um, different versions. Like, each one of their songs would have, uh, let's say you were going to record one one of their songs, they would have... 10 different drummers that took five different takes and then they would have eight different bases that took five, five and they were piecing and different now things is it, now where, that's where your engineer comes in yeah and see that's the thing they spent countless hours and when I first started listening to Steely Dan just on uh you know on whatever somebody showed it to me at first I hated the music I didn't I was like this is stupid and then I listened to it again and then I listened to it again and then I bought one of the records and put it and I have like a pretty nice system you know and I cranked it up there was half the shit in the record I did not hear at all until I put it on my system. Yep. And I met a guy, I have this album, Asia. He said in 1977, when Asia came out, people were buying the album uh, to, to show off sound systems in the display room because the album sounded so good on the system. And, you know, that guy couldn't have been any more right because I, I love that album. And you can hear so much more stuff that I was like, oh, I didn't catch that. Yep. And, 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 and no matter what quality of speaker or system that you're driving your downloaded song through you cannot get um the peripheral stuff yeah. that you want to hear on a vinyl or a cd all that's actually come from the studio um and and it's a funny thing that you that you say there a lot of the definitely the old school valve amps you've got to drive the shit out of them <laughs> to get that that depth and, and just, it's voluminous. And I'm not talking about volume as in decibels. It's just spectrum of sound. Yeah. And, and you know, I just don't think you can do it now with this downloaded shit. And, and this is why you've got people coming back to some very high-tech um, vinyl systems now where you're taking all sorts of, um, you're making all sorts of efforts to stop vibration um, any 60 cycle buzz coming in that you w- was susceptible to with some of the old stereo systems that we all grew up with. These are now all being eradicated to have the purest sound that you can get from a vinyl. Um, now, when you get that right, there's nothing can replicate it because yeah. the download doesn't sound anything like the vinyl, you know, um, and it's a bloody shame. And that's not me being a music snob. Um, because everyone would say, "Oh, well, I've got so and so speakers." Blah blah blah. A load of bollocks, mate. You want the you want definitely want the vinyl to yeah. really feel it. I mean, um, I, I I can't. I mean, it's just hard to explain without actually just doing a demonstration. Because I mean, I, I, like I said, I didn't understand until I got one. I mean, I yeah. you know I've listened to loud speakers in my buddy's car so they can turn up the rap music as loud as it'll go. And it, oh, dude, no, don't bring nothing, that one up. That's not his favorite genre. Is yeah. <laughs> Well, and then the thing, and the thing that we all miss, I think, with and and to do the click track uh, recording method that you're talking about um, is is one thing. I understand that. And that's an engineer's um, trying to get the the best from the musician within the acoustics of the building that it's being recorded in, or the sound booth that it's being recorded in. Um, but as soon as you throw a drum machine on a track, you've just killed that track. Yeah. You've killed it. You've killed the heartbeat. You There's the, 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 the relationship between the bass man and the drummer is they integral. Call it, they call that the pocket. It is the pocket. <laughs> it, and it's, it's integral, I think, to the soul of the song is that relationship between the drummer and, and, and the bass man. And, and all fights between bands 
generally are being <laughs> are between the bass man and the drummer because <laughs> one of them's trying to play too fast, one of them's trying to drown the other one out. The the drum the, the drum kit's been mic'd up wrong, you know. But when they have that symbiotic relationship, and and they're not using a cursed drum machine, it, it's 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 purity. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, you know, so I'm I'm all about getting rid of drum machines. I understand the concept of a drum machine to get the concept over to a drummer of of how you want the sound the the song to sound, but using the drum beat for the end product is not how to do it. Yeah. So you know, I'd say. And I think drummers are going to love me for this. Get a real drummer. <laughs> <laughs> you think so, huh? Oh, you're damn straight. Well, I, you know, I, I sit there and think back about, I mean, w- what a phenomenal musical conversation that we've been able to pull off here tonight. And, and I always have reservations about some of the shows we have because Colby here is, is, is half my age and he's, Probably a quarter Don't to say a it. third of Simon's age. So you shithead. <laughs> look, I'm just I'm just I'm speaking in truth here. That's how we do things on the <laughs> show. We speak in truth. But <clears throat> you know, I always kind of wanna I always enjoy having that other person here that is musically inclined, like a Kyle Forey or a Corey Hunley or or, so, or to a lesser degree a Josh Grace, um <laughs> to have on here to you know to kind of bounce off of things but i'm amazed at simon's intellect and musical knowledge over here like i am thoroughly i'm thoroughly impressed because i really enjoy music but i'm 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 so much i'm just a fan like when it comes to the technical stuff simon seems to be a fan of the technical stuff and that's where you all have been able to you know i I think if i could live my life again i would I would long, I would want to be a sound engineer in my own recording studio. I love music. I wish when I was younger I would have paid more attention in, in band class and music class and and understood that it, it's a, it's a lot more than just, you know, than, than than what they were. It ain't no damn drum machine, I can tell you that much. No, I mean I, and I, and and I think about how much fun I've had at shows. I think about, you know, the the you know, Using a fish show to get engaged to my wife. I think about some of the shows we went to before our daughter was born. Some of the shows we went to in between. Some of the greatest times we had. Some of the greatest times I've had. And I have went. And that's kind of one question I did want to ask Colby before we moved on to the next phase of things. We'll get him to play us a song or two off his album. But I I wanted to know, uh, being a, a student of music, and, and I think that's where what makes us such a good show and makes you such a good guest is because you are a student. Yeah. You really appreciate, you, you, you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it also kind of to honor the people in front of you by kind of taking their ideas. So, so if you being a musician, you're clearly, I, I would assume are very in tune to some of the, the, the major venues around the country. So for you, what's, what's one venue major venue that, that you would like to play at some point in time. And you could pull yourself back and said, man, I could die now, and I would I would consider myself a success. Oh, after I play at that venue, yeah. Um, which venue is it? Because I've been to some. I, I mean, I've I've got to go to the Georgia Theater. I've been to Red Rocks, which is phenomenal. You know, Radio City Music Hall. Been, been to some some great places, and and I know how much it means to those musicians. Yeah, so I was just curious for you. What's that one venue that you're like? I right, I've made it. If in, in my mind, if I've well, there's there's a there's a couple. Um, the first one I have to say is the Ryman Auditorium there you go. in Nashville. I've been there before too. Uh, the the you, Ryman. Are you talking about the the they don't not, people not, get confused. People think Ryman, they think Grand Ole Opry. The Opry is actually at another location. The Opry's in a location outside of town, and the Opry's in a location looks like a great big fucking resort hotel looking thing. It is uh, Opryland Hotel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but the Ryman Auditorium, the original uh, Grand Ole Opry, is the Ryman. The Ryman oh, is. You know, I'll tell a little, a quick little story. Bring back my buddy Billy Hurt here. Um, uh, the first time I ever went to Nashville was with him, and uh, he was playing at the Station Inn, which is another uh, huge bluegrass like uh, pit stop uh, on the bucket list. Uh, uh, the Station Inn is just a really awesome place. It's just like kind of like a bar, a little venue. It's got that old like like grungy feel to where like when you walk in, you feel like you just walked in 1985 or something, and you're going to see a band, pay five dollars, and see a band type thing and 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 it's really cool it's a nostalgic feel but anyway when we went there we got to go up to the Ryman Auditorium and uh you know the Ryman Auditorium is just right I mean it's like right in the middle of Nashville so it's like 
up against a bunch of other buildings. We're standing in the alleyway behind it, and he goes, Colby, you see this alleyway? I said, yeah. He said, Hank Williams pissed in this alleyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's like one of those things that like makes you go, whoa. Like, if I, you know, when I get on that stage one day, hopefully, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely feel the reverence. Um, another really big one for me would be Austin City Limits. That's one I really want to. I'd love to play on the Austin City Limit stage. That that might be possible. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I won't drop too many. De- Hopefully, next time I get on this, uh, next time I come back to the podcast, I'll have a, a good update for y'all about you know what's going on with the record and what's going on with the record company. But um, you know, they might have some ties to that stage. So hopefully, maybe there might be some things in the future that that involve that. Um, um, you know, another. Uh, I, there's a bunch of little uh, farm aid stage would be fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, farm aid is one of my favorite events that 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 happens. I mean, in high school I was in the FFA. Uh, I I love I love to support that. You know, uh, I've worked at a dairy farm. You know, off and on. You know, throughout my life, and it, it's just it's just cool to see that type of shit. You know, giving back to the farmers. Well, if you've had your hand up a cow's ass, and you uh, yeah, you you can probably come on here and speak to some people. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. And it's crazy you say the rhyming too, because you know back in the day there's some great. So I can't. Well, I don't remember for life for me. There's a bar that's butted right up against the rhyming, and you know back in the day the rhyming was a dry venue. So the artists and stuff would sneak out the back door. They walk through that alleyway into the bar next to them. Yeah, and that bar is famous to this day because it's just so many stories of legends just walking through the alley to come in there and get a beer before they went back on stage and. I got to see uh, Widespread Panic back in 2007 at the Ryman, and uh, it was one of the most memorable nights of my life for multiple reasons. You know, for, for and I'll tell the story real quick because it, it, I, I can make it short. But, you know, I was in college at the time at Radford, and it was only midway through the semester, and I had already missed my allotted number of days for a class <laughs> before my grade level would drop if I missed another day. So... I'm sitting in class, and I have this one teacher, uh, Dr. Jarezo, I'll never forget her. And I had her five different days that week. So I had her Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for one class, and Tuesday and Thursday for another. And uh, That's a lot of Billy Riddle for one week, let me it tell really you. Is. It really is. <laughs> and, and I think that's why I got away with what I got away with. So I hit her up, and it was a, um, it was a Monday morning. And, uh, and Tuesday... Panic, Widespread Panic, my favorite band, was playing at the Ryman Auditorium. First time they'd ever been there, open a night. And I'm sitting in class with her, and I get a text message from my buddy Trey over, in, over in Blacksburg. He said, got tickets for Panic. Do you want to go? I'm like, when? <laughs> he said, tomorrow. I said, where? He said, Nashville. I said, I mean, we're in Radford right now, and you're in Blacksburg. I said, that's eight hours away. I got class. What are we talking about here? He said, let's do it. And I so I thought about it for a second and said, all right. So I walked up to my teacher after class. This was the Monday class. I said, Dr. Rezo, I know that I have already missed three days for our class tomorrow. Um, But I just got a text message from my buddies. My favorite band is playing at the Grand Ole Opry, the original Grand Ole Opry, opening night, first <laughs> time I've ever played, tomorrow. And it's in Nashville. And I would really like to just drive there and catch the show and come right back. And I will be in your class on Wednesday. This class right now will be on a Wednesday. I'm going to miss tomorrow, different class. That's going to be four. I said, but if you tell me it's going to drop my grade, I'm not going to go. But if you will just excuse me for this one time and not drop my grade level, I beg of you. So she was like, I will not drop your grade in that class so long as you are here on Wednesday for this other class. You know what I mean? So we headed down the road. And uh, we jumped in and Nick Overholt's 1988 Oldsmobile. Oh, my God. It was a shit vehicle. <laughs> Driving from Blacksburg, Virginia to, to Nashville. And it oh, took us, God. It took us eight hours to get there. Because my mom and family listen to this show, I'm not going to say what we did driving down the road to get amped up for this show and uh, and to pregame for it because we were literally in a, in a, in a, in a time crunch. So we left out Tuesday morning. Woke up Tuesday morning, got to go ahead for my teacher. We jump in the car and we drive all the way down to Nashville. We get there outside of the rhyme and there's a bar across the street. We get there a couple hours for the show starts. So we're going to go over there and pregame a little bit. Order a couple of double crown and Cokes and uh, 
and I will talk about this this little. So this uh, this uh, hippie guy walking on dreadlocks walks by and he says, <laughs> "Chocolates, chocolates." <laughs> you know what that? Means. I know what that means. He's he's got some fun stuff wrapped up in the middle of those chocolates. <laughs> and uh, and so I said, "Well, absolutely." So I I I, I kill my two double crown and cokes <laughs> and I eat this chocolate. But and I'm not going to drink anymore because I'm driving home. Um, and uh, chocolate put paid to that, didn't it? Let's let's just say that what was in that chocolate you can find underneath cow shit, and uh, it was a good time. Uh, <laughs> ate the chocolate, and we waited and waited, and my and my waitress she just never showed it back up. And I was like, we gotta get to the show now. I'm, I'm tired of waiting. So I just walked across the street, and got my two double crown and cokes on the house, and uh, and it's her fault for. Never, I mean, it took an hour, and after an hour at this point in time. So we go over to the show and what a show. I mean, they ended up encoring with a chunk of coal, um, played some great tunes, got to see a phenomenal show. And so after the fact, Nick and because I hold Nick in the same high regard as I hold Josh Grice, I'm going to tell this story. Um, we couldn't find him and he was the person who had the keys and me, I'm still uh, not I'm, 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 I'm still kind of in in my chocolate range, if you know what I mean. I mean, I'm I'm not completely, but I'm still. But Nick and Trey are just bagasted as far as alcohol is concerned because they drank a ton. But I, I didn't drink because hey, you can't you can't you can't detect chocolate on a DUI. Um, but you can detect alcohol, so I, so I didn't drink that. And Nick walked out during the encore and disappeared. And Trey and I, we walked all around downtown Nashville. It's cold. We're walking around screaming for him, hollering at him, calling him. Where are you at? I'm on 4th Street. Walk down to 4th Street. Where are you at now? I'm on 1st Street. Walk down to 1st Street. Where are you at now? I'm on 7th Street. So finally, I said, look, we're going and trying to find the car now. We're going to go back and try and find the car in one of these downtown garages. And when we do, we're going to get in it and we're going to go home in your car. And you can find a bus ride home tomorrow, you drunk bastard. We don't have the time to deal with this. I got to get back to class. And uh, so... We get in the car, and then we get another phone call from him saying he's getting attacked, which was never happening. <laughs> um, all completely in his mind. And as we are driving out of town to say, good luck, catch a bus, we pull up on this street corner, and there he is standing there just looking as dejected and miserable as you can possibly look. And we pick him up in his in his car, and I start driving. And we made it almost all the way. We made it, it was somewhere between Knoxville and Bristol in 81, and all of a sudden... The car just stops. All the lights go out. The engine stops. Everything. I pull over to the to the shoulder. I'm like, well, if a state trooper don't come by here and get us now, we're gonna be stuck here until tomorrow anyway. And I'm I'm telling Trey, I'm like, he Trey's like, what the hell happened? I said, car just died. He's like, you're full of shit. I said, nope, car just damn died. And Nick is in the back, still completely oblivious to what the hell happened. <laughs> I'm like, Nick, dude, your car just died. What do we do? <laughs> What do we do? So I get out. I'm using my cell phone, looking around, trying to find something on the engine. And then I can't find anything. Don't know what the hell is going on. I go back and just sit in the car and look at Trey. I'm like, well, I'm screwed because now my teacher is going to think I'm full of shit. I'm going to get a, you know, fail these class, whatever. And somehow all of a sudden the car just re-energizes and starts right back on up. <laughs> Divine intervention. Divine Billy. intervention. I make my way to Bristol, and finally I tell Trey, I'm like, look, you've slept the entire way. It's time you drive the rest of the way home. I'm going to get back and sleep because I've got two hours before I get back to Radford. Then i got to go to class from 11 to 4. And then, by the way, I'm going to leave class. I'm going to drive straight over to Blacksburg, and I'm going to go to a football game that night, which happened to be the night that Matt Ryan just ripped the heart straight out of Virginia Tech fans back in 2007 with scoring two touchdowns in the last minute and a half of the game. So basically my week was wake up, drive to Nashville, get screwed up on more things than I care to tell my mom about, watch an amazing show, drive back, have the car break down, have Nick not know a thing about it, finally make it back, no sleep at all, go to class the entire day to go over and sit in the pouring down rain uh, still reeling from my previous, you know, night before injuries to only watch for two Tech nights before whenever it was. Yeah, ten minutes of the game, and it was, and it was like months later. Nick come up to me and he said, "Dude, 
you weren't lying about the car. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, man, I was going through the McDonald's drive through and Rocky Mount. And my car just died on me. All of a sudden, everything went blank. The engine stopped. I was like, yeah, that happened on the side of the interstate. He said, man, I was so drunk. I thought y'all were lying to me and messing with me. I thought that was just a fable. <laughs> so, yes, the Ryman Auditorium is worth whatever crazy journey you have to take to get, to get to it. Whether it be driving an 88 Oldsmobile eating chocolate mushrooms and losing your freaking whatever it may be if you have an opportunity to go to the Ryman it will blow your mind as long as it's an artist you love what, what's the time stamp on this at right now Billy a minute 53 minute 53 you need to go back and bleep something I'm not bleeping anything okay carry on as you were I'm not bleeping anything <laughs> this is what happened your this mother is, knows this is history shit hey. It could be a lot worse things I did. You know, at least I wasn't freebasing meth driving all the way down the road. You know there what I mean? Go. Just, That's right. You know, so. so anyway, the Ryman is, back to what you were saying, the Ryman is just one of those special venues. And oh, yeah. If you could make it there at some point. Hey, if you ever make it to play in the Ryman, Simon and I will jump in a car with our wives and we will drive down to Nashville. It won't be in an Oldsmobile, I can it tell you that much. It will not be in an Oldsmobile. <laughs> there will not be chocolate mushrooms. In fact, I'm sure there's a song about that somewhere. It's got to be. And if not, somebody needs to write one. So There you go, Colby. Um, all right. A piece of shit Oldsmobile. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, we're... we're we're going to let you play a couple of songs here real quick, sure. or at least one song. We're going to set that up. But but is there anybody, you know, I'll, I'll, just right quick, let's, the, the talent in Franklin County. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm happy that you are another one in a long line of talented people we have musically. You know, we were talking about this a little bit before the show, but, you know, you got your Ronnie Bowmans of the world. You got your uh, uh, Russ Roberts. um Austin, um, Mike, what the hell's his name? Um, that's Becca's daddy. Anybody listening to the show is going to know who I'm talking about. Dan Dominski lived here for a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mountain Heart recorded one of their first Doobie Shea records here in Farrell, or uh, Boone's Mill. Boone's you, know, Mill. You, you got Seth recorded, and David of, Custer. You got Seth and David Custer. You got uh, Crawford and Power. Uh-huh. You've got Billy Hurt, one of the greatest, uh, you know, fiddle players on the country and 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 then you you get down to your to your lessers and, and your josh grices of the world but the the horrible grice band is is i mean like there's so much talent in this town so i'm i'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm i'm happy that somebody like you is continuing to carry on that tradition and being a student yeah you know like the cory cory pals of the world and the and the cory or matt pals i'm sorry and the cory hunleys and the kyle forys and not the josh grices you were Sorry, Josh. No, stop apologizing to him. <laughs> stop apologizing. While we continue to apologize to him, he is a because no, I love him. He is a no talent hack, <laughs> and the only, and 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 despite my best efforts to share his lack of musical talent with the world, each and every episode that we have here, for the most part, we always play his music and, and to talk about him constantly, he still isn't doing anything with it. And and I take that as an look, I'm rolling out the path for you here, son. And you're doing nothing with it. Doing nothing. But going up on stage and belting out the same old let your band go. Let them let them let them take the name. Let them go find a lead singer and somebody with some talent. And Let's make, let's make the Hallwell Grace Band what it should be. <laughs> oh, Billy, that was ruthless. I have so much more. Well, I know from you do. Him. I, I know you were you so were holding back on that as well. Saved from him so much more. So, um, real quick. All right, we're, we're gonna we're gonna stop here in a second, and you all are gonna know anything about this. We're gonna stop. I'm gonna set up the mics because I'm gonna Colby play a couple, you know, of his songs. You all can listen to real quick. I wanted to thank all of our new Patreon subscribers we have on here, and uh, I'm gonna start somewhere in the middle. So hopefully, I didn't miss your name because we have quite a few here uh, lately. But I'll start right here um, with Olivia. Uh, not really sure what your last name is, but but we certainly appreciate it. Uh, Joyce Conroy, Cheryl Freitas Pullum, Tammy Chitwood, who is Carter Chitwood's wife. Thank you so very much for both of y'all chipping Indeed. in to us. Yeah, we certainly Indeed. appreciate all that. Brandon Scott, our buddy out in West Good Texas. Old Brandon. We're talking about uh, making a run out in West Texas sometime next year. So for him and uh, his Facebook page, I think it's SNS uh, Machine. 
Uh, I'll, I'll share it here at some point in time in the next few days because he's got some phenomenal photos out in Texas. We're gonna also it, link to Caleb. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What we're we're, we're going to make say? that West Texas run here. So, Brandon Scott, thank you so very much uh, for your contributions and, and for your potential sponsorship in the future. Us going out there to Texas, going to Big Ben, doing some shows with some you know, some old guys and shit like it. Um, Rita Riddle, my mom, thank you so very much for finally coming on board as a 40th or 50th person. Um, Heath Dillis, buddy of mine from down in Georgia. I used to uh, drive with Neil Riddle. Uh, Neil don't know you, but you have a phenomenal last name. I think we should hang out at some point in time. Dylan Taylor, one of our last guests there from Florida yep, Funeral Home, yep. uh, he became a Patreon subscriber. And Dylan, I'll know if you stop subscribing because you only wanted to listen to your show early, so don't quit us. We need that $3 a month. <laughs> Raymond, Drood, and Michael LaFew, thank you all so very much for being Patreon subscribers every little bit. Really does help. I take this Thank money. You, Mike. Yeah, I take this money and I purchase uh, alcohol, I purchase equipment, I purchase things to make these good, fun shows. We can get some, you know, some great insight like we have tonight here from Colby, and some great insight here from Simon. Thank everybody that does uh, support us. And if you haven't supported us yet, for only three dollars a month, you go to patreon.com slash get on tap. That's patreon.com. Slash get on tap. You get subscriber only episodes. You get all of our shows early when Apple Apple applicable. And you're also going to get first dibs on some of these big shows we've got coming up here in the future. We're going to probably end up selling tickets to. We're talking about Hall of Fame baseball players. We're talking about, you know, big political figures, musicians, things like that. We're going to do some live shows. We're going to give you first dibs, big time wrestlers, things like that. We might even dip into some GoPros at some point in time. We're looking to go video here soon. So the more of you that actually subscribe and help us with that financially, the faster we can go get those videos and we can take clips and, you know, use those to kind of entice people to listen to it because we're all, all just reinvest them back in our community there could be a drinking game behind that actually because every time you watch a clip and you see one of us take a sip you need to take at least two fingers yourself absolutely I mean, there's all sorts of drinking games behind that we can game of we can really make this work we really can make this work <laughs> and yes we are we're looking to go video so anybody and everybody there's also ways uh i get on tap for uh um venmo or uh the, the dollar sign get on tap for cash app wb riddle for paypal if you just want to give a 20 dollar donation five dollar donation two cents if you want to say here five cents f off hey we'll take that five cents and we'll f right on off for you we don't care we are whores um we'll take your money so thank you very much if you have subscribed and go back and listen we released a show right before our state of Appalachia episode that was a patreon only subscriber show it's a free preview go back and listen to that we talk about the 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 recent um dog napping and dog slaying incident oh that uh, got rather heated if i'm not mistaken it got really heated yeah um, rightly so you know, we talked about a, a, a state trooper that pulled over a father for rushing his daughter to the hospital. We also talked about solar farms here in Franklin County. So go back and listen to that. That is what you get on the subscriber. Those are things. The rant fests are going to, I think, are going to become uh, an integral part of the Patreon yes, every, show. Yes, every couple of weeks. Come on here. We're going to yeah. rant about things that, that we don't want to rant about in front of our guests to, to waste their time, you know, as much. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So... Before we get off here and let Colby set up and, and, and play a couple songs, where can they find you at on your social medias? And, and uh, are you on Spotify? Do you have any albums or music on any of those? So I'll uh, <clears throat> elaborate on that a little bit. So I right now, the only thing, the only two platforms I technically have music out on is, is YouTube and SoundCloud. Um, at YouTube, <coughs> look me up at Colby T. Helms. And uh, check out my Facebook page, which is also just changed to Colby T. Helms. I did have it as Colby Helms and the Virginia Creepers, but uh, yeah, I just changed it to Colby T. Helms because I'm trying to get all my social media like linked together, you know. And uh, but Sink. my my uh, my Instagram is uh, Colby T. Helms. My my YouTube is Colby T. Helms. My Facebook is Colby T. Helms. But on SoundCloud, you can still find my songs under Colby Helms. I have uh, Smoke and Flames, which is one of my most popular songs. Uh, that that has about twenty thousand views on YouTube right now, and I'll, but you can check it out on SoundCloud. And then um, you know, dreaming, uh, no higher ground. I have also on SoundCloud, um, which is another really big crowd favorite. Um, but I, I got a lot more songs on YouTube. But um, we're currently trying to make this album. It, it will be released on all platforms. It'll be on Apple Music, Spotify, the whole nine yards. Once it's done, um, Amazon Music, er- everything. So. Um, 
Yeah, I, I'll. Uh, I, I really appreciated this, guys. It's been awesome. Oh, no, um, we've an absolute ball. Like hey, we've had a blast. It's yeah, been like, a pleasure. Like been I said, uh, like I said earlier, it's uh, it's it, it amazes me how we can still manage to come together with complete strangers and have a phenomenal conversation. I really hope you can come back on again yeah. at some point in time. Let's talk music. Uh, you maybe know, maybe I can. Once you got the album some, out. Yeah, yeah, give us a nod. definitely. And even if you don't can't make it back on the show when you release the album, at least let us know. And we'll promote the hell out of it here. Let yeah, people man. know where to find it, where to get it, and uh, whenever you get to the point to where you can make it back on here, maybe we'll bring you know another musician on here. We yeah, can bounce off each other. That'd or be a great. Musician Josh Christ, something like that. We'll have somebody on here. Yeah, but we're gonna right. sign off now and come back real quick with some music to end this show, Simon. Thank you hey, this much. is this has been great. I mean, this is local talent. This is what we do, right? This is and, exactly what and, we do. You know, this is what we're here for. We I drink, love it. We drink liquor and we talk shit. So. There you go. <laughs> That's Franklin <laughs> County. Here we are. We're going to come right back with the music. Just stay tuned. This song right here, uh, it was one of the first songs I ever uh, wrote. Uh, I played it for uh, Roger Handy, who plays with the, uh, played with the Lost and Found, uh, and told him, I said, this is kind of... You inspired me a little bit to write this song because of uh, his smooth style of singing and and uh, his way of storytelling. But uh, this song uh, came about because uh, after my dad passed away, his pocket knife went missing. And one day I found it in a drawer. And I realized that it hadn't been missing, but that he had placed it in that drawer so that I w- would never lose it. And uh, But anyway, this song's called Daddy's Pocket Knife, and it's uh, one of my most sentimental songs. Uh, hope you enjoy it.
that's a you know a song that I've had a lot of older um, you know older audience members come up to me and say, you know, do you have CDs yet? Can I get that? That reminds, <laughs> that reminds me of my my husband, my late husband, or my uncle or my dad, or and you know that that means a lot to me. I've had you know YouTube pe- people on YouTube tell me, oh man, you know my dad passed away. This means a lot to me. I've had the similar things happen. So that. Yeah, it's uh, a cool. That uh, that song really means a lot to me. This next song uh, I'm gonna do is a little bit uh, more on the <clears throat> a little bit on the more of lighter lighter side of things. Uh, it's you know not quite deep as a subject. Well, actually, maybe you can say it's a deep subject. This song is a uh, it's called First Snow, and uh, it's gonna be the first song on this album. And um, I, I wrote it because um, it's kind of a, a you know a song showing off a little bit showing off. Uh, uh, my songwriting, as far as uh, what do you call it, figures of speech and um, and uh, you know literary terms and stuff like that. Uh, I call it the tongue twister song because it's got a lot of syllables in it. And uh, but uh, the song's not really about seeing your darling on the first snow. It's actually uh, about a wet dream. <laughs> you got some RC playground going on here. Yeah. You know, sex and candy. Yeah. yeah, that's what that was. With that they, the sex and candy. Uh-huh. Uh, the the lead of that that his dad was a psychologist. He said when he went down and broke that song down. Yeah, what it was about. Yeah, but. Uh, it's kind of a fun one. We like to do it at shows and see how fast we can do it. But uh, I'm going to do it a little bit at a slower tempo just so you can understand all the words. But uh, it's a fun one. It's called First Snow. song would get to where it would be so fast i was like look dude we gotta quit like we gotta quit because it's, it's like no it's, like, now. it's gonna be a marathon right yeah it's <laughs> it it got to be to where i was uh like uh i could be like well the winter i'm over to my mom she's such a beautiful side drink a little something but it gets me right because that's how the rail is rose man i'm gonna take a trip down the back road come to a camel with one gun door smoke rolling out the wood wood stove and my camel why it's almost too quick i was like man we gotta slow this down a little yeah, bit you gotta be able to breathe somewhere right yeah and uh <laughs> We call that one the auctioneer tune. I'll uh, I tell you what, I'll, I'll play one more for you just because. Hell yeah. Why not? Uh, this song right here, the reason I want to do it is because um, it's kind of one of my Franklin County, you know, anthems for myself because um, I wrote this song uh, a few years back uh, on the opening day of dove season. And, uh, you know, me and my dad and my family we used to dove hunt a lot. 
And, uh, you know, <clears throat> we don't do it as much anymore because there's not as many fields. Most of the fields aren't cutting corn by the time that dove season comes in. So it kind of fucked. But, um, but this song I wrote because me and my buddy, we had a spot, right? We were going to go on the opening day. And I had seen doves flying back and forth that whole week before the opening day. And I said, I, I said, I said, we're going to be there on the opening day. So the day before he calls me, he says, Hey, well, the guy that, owns that land, says that I can only bring one person, and there's another buddy of mine that didn't have any spots to hunt, and I was want to let you know if you could open, like, let him go instead of you. And, you know, I want to, I should have, I should have just said, fuck that guy, I'm going, but I was like, I'll be the nice guy, whatever, if he don't got a spot to hunt, I'll let him go in that spot, I got other places to hunt. So I go hunt by myself, and I go to another spot. I sat out there, and I fucking sweated my ass off. I didn't see one fucking dove. I sat, and all I'm doing the whole time is watching on their Snapchat where they're, dove down, dove down, dove down. <laughs> they killed their limit of doves that day. So being a songwriter, I said, fuck, I'm going to write a song about this. And, uh, and yeah, this song's kind of just a joke because it's kind of like uh, a song just dedicated to being, you know, spiteful that other people are doing, you know. You know and, uh, but... There's a little hidden message in there. Of course, I gotta be a good songwriter and throw a little bit of stuff about, you know, related to love in there. So, this is called the Dove Song and uh, it talks about Dove and love and everything in between. <laughs> Lord. 
Got him. Love it. Yeah, buddy. Well, I gotta say, uh, one of the fringe benefits of, of having a show like this is these opportunities where these musicians come in here and play some of these songs that, you know, at times uh, bring a little bit of nostalgia on board, and at other times you can sit back and you can see you're seeing something special in the making. You know what I mean? Like, like at some point in time, Simon, um, your great grandkids and my kids, um, cause they're going to be about the same age. Uh, they, they're all going to look back and they're probably going to remember a moment like this when somebody like here, Colby is topping the charts and whatever charts that may be. I mean, stuff like that is really what moves people. That was our private show. It really was. Nice one, how, 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 how can you, once again, it goes back to our, our deal with the living proof. All my banker friends are out there probably going going over numbers and crunching this and this right now. We're getting to sit here and listen Sorry, to music. Mother- exactly. <laughs> I didn't say Doing it. depositions, my lawyer buddies. Yeah, and we're sitting here getting to get get somebody as talented as this play two or three songs just for I mean, this is cool. You know oh, what I mean? Absolutely. This is cool. And Kobe, you are super talented. Thank you, um, thank you. I think possibly, you know, at some point in time, maybe in between now and the time you get to be selling a million records, p- perhaps you come and play the 4th of July show yeah. at Simon's, because I'm going to tell you what. The cabin and a cannon. <laughs> Billy knows all of yeah. Billy, Billy played the most recent one. Um, uh, I think I think they did reach out to Josh Grice and the Harwell Grice Band, but only as a uh, third-tier alternative. That means if the first three bands couldn't make it, then... <laughs> Josh, but but Josh said he wanted to, in, in fairness to him and and to save some of his dignity. I think he said he would rather just come there and hang out and have a good time as opposed to playing, which makes a lot of sense. He doesn't want to walk away with his tail between his legs like he did the night by not showing up. But thank you for for coming on board and that music. We're not even, normally we end the show with all our Grace Band music. Um, Angie's song. Uh, we play Changing the Leaves to start the show and Angie's song to end the show. We're not going to end the show. We're gonna just going to end the show on that music right there. And that was we're, not, we're not We're not even going to do that that three-song performance a disservice by going into a Harwell Grace song to end the show. So. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. No, stop apologizing <laughs> to him. He deserves... He deserves nothing. He deserves I, nothing. I think that's quite appropriate, though. That was uh, a private show. Loved it. Thank you, guys. Um, Appreciate it. You know, great structure, great song. Um, I'm surprised my daughter didn't bust in here and start dancing. I really am. I don't I'm know where she's she at. Right I'm surprised she did not bust in and start dancing. She's so. going to go, why didn't you invite me, Daddy? Yeah, I wanted to hear that. I said, well, you'll be able to hear it for the rest uh-huh. of your life, baby. There I, you go. I promise you, you'll be in on some of these here in the near future when you're old enough to be able to appreciate them. But, you know... Colby, once again, thank you so much for your come time. Come back after the album. Yeah, yeah. come yeah, back man. before or after, whenever you want to just shout us out, hit us up. Yeah. Let us know. We'll uh, we'll promote what you got going on. We try and do that for everybody that gives us our time because, for me, time is the most valuable resource there is on, in the world. Yeah. So if you give us our time, I'm going to make sure I take every opportunity to promote you, support you, tell people where you're playing, give them, give them an opportunity to go out and see you. Um, yeah, keep us in the loop. Yeah, man, I'll, I'll definitely give y'all a, a shout out. Uh, I can't wait to you know hear this, listen back, and and hear hear some of our stuff tonight. It's been awesome. Well, if yeah. you want to hear this show early, which you're probably not going to now, but if you want to hear the next one early, get on patreoncom slash get on tap for only three dollars a month. Of course, you can't give more. Uh, you get all these episodes early. You get subscriber only content. We hear Simon and I and uh, multiple other people rant. I talked to uh, Steve Mowry. He's a Bellator MMA fighter down in Florida. I think he's going to join us on one of these Zoom calls here soon. He's very based. He beats the shit out of people for a living. And at the same time, he Lucky likes bastard. talking crap about the government. He dislikes them as much as we. So he's going to be on one of our subscriber-only shows coming up here in the future. We've got some great shows for y'all coming up on tap. Play on words right there. So, Simon, Colby, thank y'all so very much. Yeah, man. It's been my pleasure, this well, one. My pleasure. We'll catch you the next time. Peace out.